Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's lesson. This is Eric Scheidel, the HVAC Service Mentor, and I am so happy to have you all with us today. Today's lesson is going to be all about electronic circuit boards for HVAC applications. And specifically, we're going to learn how to uh, troubleshoot and work with electronic circuit boards more effectively. The uh, idea for this class came from lots of feedback from technicians in the field. And I still get lots and lots and lots of questions uh, regarding electronic circuit boards. And there is a lot of confusion around electronic circuit boards for technicians. And so uh, this class is going to help give you the, the tools that you need to be able to uh, work more effectively with electronic circuit boards. One of the scenarios that comes up over and over again, it goes something like this, and this is repeated time and time and time and time again. I get messages about this. And it goes something like this. So uh, two technicians have been already out on the call and uh, determined that the circuit board was bad. And so the circuit board got replaced, and two weeks later the same problem happens again, or that immediately happens again, or it didn't solve the problem. And as a result, technicians are left feeling that I'm challenged with electronic circuit boards. And oftentimes there's, there's more to it than that. And so one of the biggest keys to being able to understand electronic circuit boards and identify faults with them and troubleshoot them effectively is knowing what they do. What is the purpose of the thing? What is its actual function in the system? And once you're able to understand that at, at a very uh, in strong level, then troubleshooting then becomes a lot easier. Uh, when we're looking at an electronic circuit board like this one, uh, there is all kinds of stuff going on here. All these wires that are coming out of this one is in the system, and it almost looks magical. And one of the challenges that many mechanical technicians have, uh, mechanical people, is that you can't see what's going on inside of here which makes it a little bit mysterious and um, almost magical at times. And they're not really that mysterious, they're not really that magical, and uh, after this lesson you're going to have a lot more confidence in dealing with electronic circuit boards. Now, circuit boards are everywhere these days. The very first instance of an electronic circuit board appearing in a heating product, which was a, a, fur a gas furnace, happened in 1978, and this march toward more uh, electronic controls and digital controls has been progressing forward steadily ever since. For example, here I've got a Honeywell uh, damper actuator. We've got Honeywell damper actuator. The job of this little fella here is um, multifold, and this is one of the keys of understanding how to troubleshoot things with electronic circuit boards. Check it out. This thing has an electronic circuit board mounted inside of it that operates the whole thing. The job of this little critter is to position the damper in the correct location upon demand and provide feedback telling what position the damper is in. Um, lots of sophistication in this, and this is back in circa of uh, 2007, so it's not super old, but it's not super new either. And uh, like I said, the, the first circuit board appeared in a heating product back in 1978 in a residential gas furnace. So let's go ahead and get into this whole circuit board um, equation, if you will, and identify some of the ways the most common circuit boards function, what they do, and how to troubleshoot on them. So before we do that, the first thing we need is a little bit of a history lesson. Now, if you haven't done many uh, classes with me before, this is me. This is how you get in touch with me. My name is Eric Scheidel. I run a, a company called HVAC Service Mentor. And the best way to uh, find out about other training programs that I offer, if you like this kind of thing, is right here at the website at HVACServiceMentor.com. And there you'll find uh, the latest schedule as well as uh, interesting technical, technical articles and um, uh, what we're doing online as well as live and in person in various places. If you want to reach out to me directly, the best place is here at the uh, email, which is eric at hvacservicementor.com. Now you notice that I looked in this direction 
over toward where the image is on your screen. And that'll be a cue for you throughout the rest of this lesson that when I look in this direction, which is my right, probably your left, when I look this way, you should look that way too because I am focusing your attention on something that's on the screen at this time. I'm a big picture guy. I like to know what the main idea is. And then everything else becomes details. So part of knowing what the main idea is, is to know what came before. It's critical to know that all of our electronic controls that we're working with today have their roots in things that are much, much older. There's a history here. And the electronic controls we have now essentially duplicate the function of the earliest control. So it's very helpful for us to know what came before. This is part of the fun of being a heating and air conditioning service technician because we get to work on systems that are much, much older than us. In fact, I told you that first electronic circuit board became out in 1978. And I was just a kid in 1978, but I've worked on those systems because uh, they're still out there in some cases. And, uh, you know, as a HVAC technician, you have to be proficient or at least able to service equipment dating back to the 1800s and all through today. And it's not possible for any one person to know everything there is to know about everything. Uh, instead, it's much more helpful to know the main idea or the basic idea around it. And once you know that, then you can apply that knowledge to all these other things that have come before and start to understand them. You kind of learn as you go. You take the main idea, apply it to the unique thing that you're looking at now, and discover the details about it. So we're going to do that approach with electronic circuit boards. Now, in the beginning, in indoor comfort heating systems, the only kind of control we had was manual. And here's an example of a manually controlled heating appliance, the potbelly stove in the, in the room. The only way to actually control the uh, comfort level produced by this heating appliance is to either add more wood or coal to the fire, right? That's a manual operation. Uh, operate a manual draft damper, and that's, look over here right in the center, this little round dial right there, that's, a, that's an opening to allow more or less air to control the rate of the fire. How fast does it burn? How much heat is it producing per hour? So there is a bleeds of control there. And then for fine tuning, a person could move their selves in their chair closer to or further from the fire to uh, really fine tune things. And if you've ever lived in a home uh, that was heated with solid fuel, either coal or wood or corn cobs, um, uh, wood pellets, the uh, ability to maintain a consistent temperature is very difficult. It's either really hot or it's not. And uh, you're constantly going back and forth between those extremes. And uh, a campfire, same way, you know, throw some logs on the fire and it's, and it's huge and you got to get back a little bit. And then as it dies down, you move closer and closer and closer. That is what we're talking about here. That is that type of control. As we're going to learn, one of the reasons why we have these electronic controls is to make things more accurate so that we don't have that wide uh, range of temperature fluctuations anymore. Here's an example of that manual control. This was your thermostat back in the days of the pot-bellied stove. And uh, I like to think that the shape of this draft damper here that would be operated by hand to control the rate of the fire, this is very similar to the shape of the old round Honeywell thermostat, the round T87F thermostat. And I like to think that the reason why the T87F thermostat is round is because for generations previously, people were used to adjusting a round draft damper such as this to control the rate of the fire. And of course, we still have this control on lots of uh, charcoal-fired barbecue grills, right? This is the way we adjust the heat rate, the cooking speed in our barbecue grill. Mechanical controls have no electronics. It's all, um, the, oh, sorry. The next phase of evolution beyond manual control was mechanical control. Mechanical controls have no electronics. Instead, they have a sensing element which responds to a change in temperature, and then it will physically move a valve or a damper open or closed. And this is duplicating 
the action of the manual controls, right? In the manual controls, the sensing element was you, the, your physical sensation. And moving the valve or damper open and close was once again you, physically moving the valve or the damper open or close. In a mechanical control, the human sensing element is replaced by a mechanical sensing element. And this mechanical sensing element will then take over that motion in response to temperature. So the basic idea here is we have something moving in response to temperature, which duplicates the previous thing of a human moving in response to temperature. Some examples of a mechanical control are, for example, the uh, automatic um, um, gas control thermostat combination in a conventional water heater. This device has a temperature sensing element right here, inserts into the water tank to sense and feel the water temperature. And inside of that sensing element is a fluid. And that fluid or that substance will expand when it gets warm and it will contract when it gets cool. And so this is how it responds to temperature, expanding as it gets warm, contracting when it gets cool. As it contracts, it shrinks and something physically moves and based on the set point of the dial. And the dial really just adjusts the tension of a spring that counteracts the pressure in the bulb. Between those two pressures, we will open, physically open and physically close a valve to allow the gas to flow to create fire and heat or to not allow the gas to flow to create fire and heat. Here we have something physically moving in response to temperature, right? As temperature falls, this fluid contracts, opening the valve, allowing the heat to turn on, allowing the temperature to increase, allowing the fluid in the bulb to expand, pushing the valve closed. That's how these controls operate. Some other examples, thermostatic radiator valve does exactly the same thing. But now instead of sensing water temperature, it senses the surrounding air temperature around the control. Instead of opening and closing a valve that flows natural gas, it opens and closes a valve that flows warm water into the radiator on demand. Something moving and physically moving a valve in response to temperature. Another common example that we're seeing a lot more of these days in air conditioning is the thermostatic expansion valve. Thermostatic expansion valve physically opens and closes a valve in response to temperatures, and in this case also, pressures, the response to temperatures and pressures. So the idea here is that the device has a sensing element that will sense the controlled medium, whether it be controlling pressure, whether it be controlling temperature or a combination of both, whatever that is, and then it will physically move to operate a valve, which is the controlled device. Interestingly enough, all of these devices are in the process of being replaced with electronic controls, which are all available now. Uh, thermostatic expansion valves have been, are being uh, replaced by electronic expansion valves. Uh, the water heater mechanical gas valves are now electronic. And the uh, thermostatic radiator valves are also electronic as well. Now, the old versions still exist, but the, the march of uh, technology moves forward. The next level of control that has begun to replace mechanical is electromechanical. Building off of what came before, this is the trend that I want you to see. This is what you're going to find in the field all the time. Electromechanical control con combines the mechanical control with something moving in response to temperature and combines it with an electric switch. So now instead of that thing that's moving in response to changing values in the controlled medium, operating a valve directly, now it operates a switch which can then electrically, not electronically, but electrically control a valve or a, a motor or a heater or et cetera. Some good examples of electromechanical controls is the mercury bulb style thermostat, where a uh, uh, temperature sensitive bimetal coil will move in response to changes in temperature and that movement then will cause a electric mercury switch to make or break a set of electrical contacts and then that electrical signal can be sent to control relays or gas valves open and close or or uh, damper actuators open and close or water valves open and close so on and so forth so now look at what we're, our results are here though 
our level of uh, uh, automation is better, right? The human being has much less to do with it. And the physical size of these sensing elements are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, which be is good because they, uh, as we get something for them to control to be smaller and smaller, they can be smaller, which means they are more accurate. The temperature sensing element in this thermostat, for example, is much more accurate to changes in temperature than the element in this thermostatic radiator valve. Also, it can be positioned in a much more convenient place. This thermostatic radiator valve senses temperature at the floor, where uh, we would prefer to have temperature sensing up on the middle of the wall, which is how the thermostat gives us an advantage. Aquastat relay, boiler control, very common very you know been out there for a long time here i've got a temperature sensitive element just like our water heater control hand but now instead of physically opening and closing a gas valve it opens and closes a set of electrical contacts which will then power open or power close a gas control fan and limit control from our old forced air furnaces this has a temperature sensitive element which moves in response to temperature inside the furnace and as the furnace warms up it will move and as it moves it will trip a switch to turn on the fan and then at the end of a cycle demand for heat it will move back the other way as things cool off to turn the fan off at the correct temperature so this is temperature controlled fan control it has a dual purpose so that if the temperature gets way too high it will move even further and trip a switch that will shut off the heat source shut off the burners so that things don't overheat. Once again, something physically moving, operating a switch, which then controls the final outcome. So all along, controls have been evolving from manual to mechanical to electrical mechanical. And the reason for this is in order to provide a greater accuracy, more independent automation, and it also allowed the safe use of liquid and gas fuels. In order to have liquid and gas fuels, boy, having this automatic operation is a huge advantage. Combine those two together, and now we're in the modern age. No longer are we chopping wood and hauling ash and all that kind of stuff. Things are much more automatic. These control uh, evolutions also bring greater convenience, better comfort, fuel savings, and greater safety to our heating appliances. Also, this is what makes refrigeration possible. It's this control evolution based on what people did manually to make it more automatic. And the implications of this for a society are actually huge, right? If it weren't for the ability to use liquid and um, gas fuels, and if it wasn't for the possibility of uh, vapor compression refrigeration systems that are automatically electrically controlled, uh, there's large areas that simply would be uninhabitable for human beings. It just wouldn't be possible for us to live there. And plus, if we're relying on solid fuel uh, all the time, that brings in air pollution, that brings in quality of life, that brings in uh, health and safety issues, as well as deforestation, right? If we're burning everything in wood, we would have cut down all the trees long ago. Uh, so the implications of this control evolution are tremendously important to us as a, as a species and as a people. And I, I really like to take note of that as I'm working on something like this, this electronic control here, which we'll talk about a little more, realizing that this is partially responsible for the quality of life that we enjoy as a people. So this control evolution reached a high point right here with this device. Take a, take a look at this image that's on the screen. This is called the um, Mercoid oil burner control. This, um, this device was manufactured somewhere in the mid-1940s, right in that World War II era. Um, what this, on the back side of this, this is called a stack oil primary. And the, there is a, a sensing element that would insert into the flue of an oil burning boiler or forced air furnace. And what it would do is it would allow for the automatic ignition of uh, fuel oil. But if it didn't feel the heat of the flame within a certain time after the demand for ignition happened, it would stop the flow of fuel oil to the burner. 
because the, if there's not any heat being generated, that means that oil is flowing, but it's, it hasn't been safely lit, and now it's just accumulating into an unsafe puddle of oil in the burner. And when that does light, it's going to create a big problem. So this was the highlight of electromechanical controls, and this is about as sophisticated as electromechanical controls got in our industry. Uh, allowed for the automatic ignition of fuel oil and for the safety shutdown if for some reason that fuel oil did not light, which brought us to uh, a much greater level of safety. But it had its limitations, right? Uh, it would normally have to allow that fuel oil to flow to the burner nozzle for a significant period of time to before it would um, shut things down. So uh, yes, it would, it would minimize an unsafe condition, but it couldn't prevent it entirely. So this was an advantage over um, other methods of lighting uh, fuel oil, but still had some issues. And uh, that was the limitation of this. This is about as good as it could get. This particular design and this idea was with us for literally decades. Like I said, this one uh, picture is from 1940-something. Uh, ultimately, it became this one, which is a device from 1970-something, some 30 years later, and even on into the 1980s, this R117A, it's called the protector relay, stack primary control, was the standard oil burning um, con ignition control device and safety device. Somewhere in the mid-1980s, this came on the scene, or maybe late 1970s, this came on the scene. This is an electronic controller that replaced that um, electromechanical control. And this brought a new level of safety. This was able to shut the burner down in a very short period of time rather than the longer period of time experienced by the electromechanical control, enhancing safety, enhancing automation, and uh, also enhancing reliability. Electronic controls generally function better over time than their electromechanical counterparts do. The advantages of electronic controls, why we got here, increased accuracy, faster safety response, safer operation, better fuel economy, lower production costs for manufacturers, and improved reliability. But at a basic level, all these controls perform the same basic function as the electromechanicals that they replaced. So knowing the history, knowing the sequence of operations of a particular piece of machinery is incredibly important in order to understand what your electronic circuit boards do, because they basically do the same thing that the old things do. Maybe they have a little bit more going on. Maybe they have um, some additional features that at the basic level still the same thing as before, right? Responding to a series a set of conditions and providing a response. Now to reinforce that idea, I want to show you this thing here. This is uh, this is called the Emerson Shure. Uh, Emerson Sure Switch Contactor. This is a contactor for a uh, air conditioning condensing unit. Uh, could also be used in some refrigeration condensing units. It operates the compressor and the condenser fan motor. And this is an electronic device that replaces traditional contactors. Here is its control board on the back side. Get that in the light there. And there's a microprocessor on here. There's a, some intelligence built in here. The function of this device is virtually the same as a traditional contactor. It energizes the, um, it closes contacts to energize the compressor and condenser fan motor when there is a demand for cooling. It responds to a 24 volt control input, just like a standard contactor does. One of the big differences on this little critter is cost, however, right? This, this guy retails for about $115, which is a lot more expensive than a traditional contactor. And before you say, whoa, wait a minute, that is way more money than I'm used to paying for contactors, you're right, but you get a whole lot more value out of it too. So let me explain one of some of the additional features that this little critter does with a circuit board on it and some intelligence. One thing that it does is it provides brownout protection. If you're in an area where the power supply could be unreliable and uh, line voltage can be uh, allowed to fall, below the nominally acceptable value, that can and will damage your compressor. This little device will sense that and prevent the compressor from trying to energize 
when the incoming voltage is insufficient. So now, when you realize that this little device, while it may cost a little more, will save a compressor and can potentially save a whole um, you know, freezer or cooler full of food, now that's not so expensive anymore. The value is there. The ability is there, which a traditional contactor just doesn't have. The other thing that it has the ability to do is called an anti-short cycle timer. If there, is a, if there is something wrong, such as the low pressure switch is continually opening, um, and that compressor is now banging on and banging off, banging on, banging off, banging on, banging off. That is going to create additional wear and tear and ultimately compressor failure. This will protect against that by making sure there is five minutes between every on cycle of the, of the um, compressor. Some units have that feature built in uh, to the other circuits, but this one has it built into the contactor. So adding this adds that feature has the same test feature where I can just push a button and it will cycle through and it will operate. I can um, adjust the time delay with these little dip switches. And I can even uh, get some diagnostic feedback. And they're making examples of this that will interface with other electronic controls to provide additional safety protection to those compressors. So a whole lot more features built into something like this. Another thing you should know about this particular device is that the uh, power switching contacts for the compressor and the condenser fan um, have a much higher duty cycle than traditional contactors do. So this contact will also last and hold up uh, three to five times longer than a traditional contactor. And I want to show you that just to illustrate the advantages of some of these electro electronic controls replacing electromechanical controls. Once I explain to you all of the things that this thing does, those of you experienced in air conditioning would be saying, boy, I can think of a lot of applications that this would be a tremendous value in, and I would definitely like to use it there. And I, I absolutely agree with you. So those are some of the advantages of electronic controls. And this is in response to sometimes folks say, why do we need all this complicated electronic stuff? This is hard to work on. What, what is it, why is this necessary? Why can't we just do this with a thermocouple and a, a, a temperature controlled fan switch like we used to back in the olden days? And these are the reasons why. This is the results that we're getting from these electronic controls. Some of the common types of controllers that we're going to find out there in equipment are uh, primarily these gas ignition control modules, also oil primaries as well. Uh, blower uh, control boards for forced air furnaces, integrated furnace controls, as well as integrated rooftop control modules for packaged rooftop units, and electronic thermostats. These are some of the most frequently encountered uh, electronic controls that we're going to find in the field today. To add to that, we have some others as well, uh, such as the heat pump defrost controller, also the refrigeration defrost controller, hydronic zone controllers in boiler systems, delay timers, communicating controls, which is a whole nother aspect of electronic control modules, which we'll talk about at the end of this lesson, economizer controls, and many, many, many more as well. Some of the manufacturers that you're going to start getting used to seeing if you uh, haven't been in the industry for a long time are brands like Fenwall, Heatcraft, Honeywell, longtime player, of course, ICM Controls. Now, ICM is a neat company. ICM made a lot of OEM controls. And when I say OEM, that's short for Original Equipment Manufacturer. For example, a company like Lennox or Carrier or um, uh, Payne or Train or uh, any of those, those are the original equipment manufacturers. The electronic control boards in their products are generally going to be produced by one of these companies. And ICM made a lot of control boards for lots of OEMs over the last 30 years. So you're going to find lots of ICM controls out there. Johnson controls as well, lots of Johnson control boards out there. Robert Shaw made a lot of electronic circuit boards, especially in the 1980s and through the 1990s. Uh, and today I'm not seeing so many Robert Shaw electronic circuit boards, but I do see still a lot of Robert Shaw gas control and still some older style electromechanical controls coming out of Robert Shaw. United Technologies. Uh, United Technologies is actually the parent company for Carrier Corporation, UTI. And UTI had a division that made electronic controls, 
you'll find a lot of UTI uh, control boards in carrier products. You'll also find a lot of ICM controls in carrier and their related family of products as well. And finally, White Rogers. White Rogers not too long ago was absorbed by a company called Emerson Climate Technologies. And Emerson Climate Technologies has quietly been buying up a lot of um, HVAC related OEM suppliers, such as um, White Rogers is one of them. White Rogers, of course, very familiar for uh, thermostats. Um, also, they own Browning belts, they own Copeland compressors, they own uh, Alco flow controls. A bunch of other brands have all been kind of homologated into the uh, into the uh, um, uh, Emerson Climate Technologies company. For example, here I've got a uh, control board. I don't know if you can see that or not, but right here it's got the the White Rogers logo on it. And here I've got another control board that has the uh, Emerson Climate Technologies logo on it. And both of these boards are essentially made by the same company. Now this product came out of a, um, a Goodman or a Mana furnace, and this one came out of a train. Now one thing that you need to know when it comes time to replace an electronic circuit board is the manufacturer of the circuit board has their own part number for that control board. Also, some manufacturers may make universal or replacement parts as well. The best place to, the best way to source a replacement control board is by referencing the OEM's make, model, and serial number. That is the best way to get a replacement control board. For example, this control board, like I said, is from a train product. And on the, on the uh, label here, it says it has a White Rogers Emerson Electric Company model 50A61-605. So if I'm working on this furnace and I want to replace this control board, um, and if I were to call down to my local supply house and say, hey, I need a, a White Rogers Emerson model 50A61-605, they may go to um, the parts lookup for Emerson White Rogers, look up that number, and they may say something like, that's, a, that's not a valid cross. I don't have a, I don't have a number for that what is the original make, model, and serial number of the appliance you're working on. They'll be able to cross it versus, based on that. Because the, uh, the OEM will have their own part number for this, and it will be different than the supplier's part number or White Rogers' part number. For example, this, uh, this device right here on this Goodman has a part number of a 50M56-291-02. I wouldn't necessarily be, have good success ordering this off of that part number. But if I were to say uh, I'm working on a model uh, GMP 075 dash whatever it is, then I could get the right control board for that furnace and whatever the modern iteration of that is. Because these things change over time, right? So if this is a 10 or 15 year old furnace that I'm working on, um, the replacement control board may not even be made by the original equipment manufacturer anymore. In fact, this control board right here, it's the same as this control board right here. This one was manufactured by a completely different supplier than this one was. This one is newer, this one is older. Let's talk about gas ignition controls. This is one of the most common uh, control boards, electronic controls that we're going to find out there. And I want to study this gas ignition control, and it's going to reveal a lot about what a lot of other controls do as well. The one on the screen here is the ICM 290. I've got a whole box of these sitting next to me here. Here's, here's our ICM 290 control. The ICM 290 control is also the same as the Honeywell s 8610 u control, which is based off of the old Honeywell S86F control. All of these are what are known as intermittent pilot gas ignition control modules. Gas ignition controls can be found in almost any type of gas appliance, from a, a furnace to a rooftop unit to a boiler to a unit heater 
Lots of cooking appliances and commercial kitchens and food service uh, arenas have these in them. Um, water heaters, some industrial process equipment. You're going to find these all over the place. And uh, it's a good place to start getting to know how electronic circuit boards work. There's three major kinds of gas ignition control. There's the intermittent pilot, we just discussed. There is the non-integrated HSI, where a hot surface igniter lights the main burner directly, no pilot involved at all. And there is the direct spark controller, which is a little bit more rare. They're not as common, but they are out there, uh, where a spark lights the main burners directly. Let's take a look at the intermittent pilot control. The first thing you need to know about all intermittent pilot controls and all circuit boards in general is they do nothing until they are powered up, and they are powered up by 24 volts. 24 volts AC. Um, this controller does nothing at all until there is a demand for heat. And that demand for heat, which is coming from the thermostat, through the limit switches, through the pressure switch safeties, if there are any, ends up right here at the THW connection. TH is short for thermostat. This is a signal coming from the thermostat ultimately. When we receive 24 volts on the TH terminal, the control wakes up and it begins its sequence. There are some other 24 volt terminals on here as well. Let's talk about those real quick. There's a 24V, there's a 24V GND, and there is a GND terminal. Now, inside of this electronic control and inside all intermittent pilot controls, all of our 24 volt commons and our grounds are connected together inside the control. So let's go through these um, labels and identify what they mean. THW, that is the thermostat connection or the demand for heat connection. 24 volts. This device has the ability to operate a um, vent damper. And that vent damper is powered by this 24 volt AC signal here. So if you measure 24 volts on this terminal, on this control board that has a vent damper attached to it, it would be plugged in to that terminal right there. Um, that 24 volts does not power the control. That 24 volts passes through the control out of this Molex plug to go on to power the vent damper. Very important to know. 24 volts ground. This isn't necessarily ground. What this means is it's the grounded conductor of the 24 volt power supply, also known as common or C. GND, ground, this does mean actual ground. This is sometimes also called burner ground. And this is simply just a wire from this terminal to a convenient grounding point or a, a metal connection of the furnace near the burner. So when you're looking at furnaces and you're looking at the burners and you see a green or a yellow and green wire just attached to the burner manifold or attached to the gas control valve or attached to the pilot burner bracket, that will be ultimately landing on this ground terminal here. PV stands for pilot valve. MVPV, let's go back to, let's skip that one for a minute and go over here to MV. MV is main valve. So this is our pilot gas valve. This is our main gas valve. Both of those are 24 volts. MVPV is common to the pilot valve and the main valve. It's our C connection. So internally, MVPV, ground, and 24 volt ground are all physically attached inside of here. So we could just swap these wires around with one another and it would have no difference in the way the system worked. Two things are very important here though, that the sec one secondary leg of the transformer be grounded and that the control itself be grounded as well. Sometimes that grounding of the secondary is happening right here because these two terminals are connected together. Therefore, if this is not landed as a ground, then we will have an ungrounded secondary as well. So all these connections are important. THW, of course, is what powers the control and it makes everything else happen. So when, now there's a sequence of events that happens here. There's a timing involved. All electronic circuit boards are essentially timers plus relays. So when this is powered up, it will begin a timed sequence of operations. And that sequence is really going to just involve closing electrical contacts 
in sending that voltage in different locations at different times. Okay, so let's go forward. 24 volts lands on the THW terminal. That's a steady demand. At the same time, it's, well, after a certain period of time, maybe five seconds, it will begin its ignition sequence. It will close a set of contacts internally between the THW terminal and the PV terminal. So the 24 volts that came in from the thermostat through the limit, through the pressure switch, now goes out the PV terminal to energize pilot valve. So pilot gas should begin flowing. At the same time, the spark begins sparking on the spark box. So now I have delivered fuel to the burner. I'm delivering an ignition source to the burner at the same time. It is automatically trying to light. As soon as that pilot flame is established, it will be recognized by a process called flame rectification. And that happens over here on the flame sensor terminal. And we'll talk a lot more in great detail about flame rectification in just a little bit. So right now, let's just realize that it has a means to identify that, yes, the pilot flame has lit. Once it recognizes that the pilot flame has been lit, the next stage in the sequence takes over. And that is, A, stop sparking, because we've successfully lit, we can stop the ignition source, and now energize main valve. So now a second set of electrical contacts between the THW terminal and the MV terminal, actually probably between PV and MV, will close, sending that same 24 volt signal that came in, now it will send it out to MV. So at this point, I will measure on my multimeter, I'll measure 24 volts between THW and 24 volt ground, between PV and 24 volt ground, and MV and 24 volt ground. I should have 24 volts on all three of these terminals, and I will also have main burner firing. So now you realize that this is merely just a sequence of events of following a sequence, a timing structure, and closing electrical contacts. So if I experience my main flames are just randomly going out, which is a, a common complaint, the question should be, when do they go out and what else is going on when that happens? So for example, I will want to be watching with my eyes the flames and at the same time I want to have a meter connected between terminal MV and MVPV or I could have the other line on 24 volt ground because they're both connected internally, it doesn't matter. So when I see my flames go out, do I also see 24 volts disappear on MV at the same time, yes or no? If I do see 24 volts disappear on MV and at the same time as my main flames extinguish, now I know that my control board is de-energizing the main valve. Okay, now, does that mean the control board is bad? Not necessarily, right? There could be another reason for it. So now I want to know, when I lose 24 volts at MV, do I also lose 24 volts at THW, yes or no? Now I'm going to need two multimeters working at the same time, right? I'm going to have one connected between MV and 24 volt ground, and another one connected between THW and 24 volt ground. If I discover that I lose 24 volts at MV and I also lose 24 volts at THW at the same time, well, that's not the fault of the control board, right? That's something upstream. That's our pressure switch or our limit control or a thermostat or our wiring in between or rollout switches perhaps, but it's not the control board's fault, right? Something else is happening. You have to know that all of these things have to happen first and where that sequence of electricity flows through this board. Now, if I have a steady signal of 24 volts at my THW terminal, and then I'm losing my MV randomly, well, now one of two things is happening. Either the control board is malfunctioning, or something is going on with the flame sensing circuit, and it's either failing to sense flame properly, or it is having a flame disturbance near the sensor, or the flame sensor is dirty, or it's not grounded right, or a number of other things that contribute to flame sensing that we'll talk about in a little bit. 
So I wanted to kind of give you an idea that you've got to know what the thing does, what it's supposed to do, before you can identify what it's not doing right. It's a very common complaint that I have. I see, I see people um, send videos that show the main burner lighting and the main burner going out, and I say, what's wrong with it? Well, I can't tell you that. I can tell you that you need to start taking some measurements in specific places with your multimeter to be able to identify what's causing that. That's the necessary next step. Okay, and that's in order to know what to measure, where to measure, you have to know what the thing does. Now, this sequence of events happens on almost every intermittent pilot gas control ever made. They all function basically the same way. You're going to find some slight differences in the nomenclature, the labeling of the terminals. And uh, so when you're out there looking at all of these things, even on ordinary, everything's working fine, planned maintenance visits, Inspect these, look at these, look at how they're labeled, look at the similarities between different brands, look at the differences between different brands and get to know what these terminals mean and that's going to take time and experience. But once you do, this sequence of events is the way that they all work. We'll note about vent dampers real quick. Uh, this control board has a, a little jumper plug plugged into it and this board is going to operate without a vent damper. If this jumper pin, here's one right here, this jumper pin, there it is, is removed and uh, this control is placed into operation, uh, it will blow a little micro fuse inside so that it can never be used without a vent damper attached ever again. And this is to prevent if the vent damper fails and someone just unplugs it to try to plug a jumper wire into working it, it won't. The vent damper has to be connected and it has to be open in order for the control to fire. That's a safety device. On um, this new S8610U control, notice there is no plug in there at all. This one has some more sophisticated electronics involved and so it, after it fires a certain number of times if there is or is not a vent damper installed, it will only operate after that with the damper installed or with it not plugged in, depending on how it was first fired up. So be aware, you cannot take a uh, intermittent pilot control out of a vent damper operated appliance and put it into a non-vent damper operated appliance. It just won't, they won't work that way. Once they're being used with a vent damper, that's it, you're done. You're not gonna use it on anything else ever again. You can never use that control without a vent damper ever again. So this is that basic sequence of operations. When the thermostat calls for heat, the control is powered with 24 volts AC through the limit and pressure switch safeties. The control will energize the pilot valve and the spark electrode at the same time. When the pilot flame is established and proven through flame rectification, the spark is de-energized and the main valve is energized. The control will continue to measure and monitor the flame signal throughout the run cycle if the flame signal goes out of specification, the control will de-energize the main valve and the pilot valve and start over again. When the thermostat is satisfied, the entire control is de-energized and therefore the gas valve is de-energized also. Everything's powered by 24 volts AC. There are variations on this theme, some slight variations that you'll run into in the field. This, this basic sequence of operations is the sequence of operations for all intermittent pilot ignition controls. But there are some variations. Here they are. Number one is pre-purge. A pre-purge is a delay period between the time when the control is energized and when the ignition sequence begins. This is to allow the draft blower to operate for a period of time to clear out any unburned gas or any other uh, leftover products of combustion. For example, if the, um, uh, if the furnace were to be uh, lose power, for example, in the middle of a run cycle, it would just immediately shut down. There could be leftover uh, fuel or there could be unburned fuel or there could be leftover combustion products lingering around the burner area. So the manufacturer of this appliance has decided that in order to prevent that from causing any problems, I'm going to make sure that every time this furnace goes to fire, I'm going to allow that draft blower to run for a period of time, say 15 seconds or 30 seconds, before the actual ignition sequence begins. 
For example, here is an uh, intermittent pilot ignition control. This is out of a Lennox furnace. And you'll notice this one looks almost exactly like this one does. Same box, same terminals, uh, the spark igniter is even in the same place. This one, this one has a label on it that says 90 second, I'm sorry, 30 second PP stands for 30 second pre-purge. So when this one receives its 24 volts on uh, the 24 volt or THW terminal, this one will wait 30 seconds before it fires up. Because this came out of a draft induced appliance, that draft inducer was running first, it had closed the pressure switch, sent the 24 volts to the control, and it just sits there for 30 seconds before it goes through its ignition sequence. This control says, Pre-purge time, zero seconds. So this one, when it gets its 24 volts, is going to begin its ignition sequence almost immediately. That is a difference between these two. Trial for ignition is another a variable. This means how long will it try to light the pilot? This one says 90 second trial. This one also says 90 second trial for ignition. This one, this older one here, says non-100% shutoff, which means it's not going to stop trying. It's always going to be trying to like that pilot flame, energizing PV as long as it has 24 volts to it. Retries, the number of trials for ignition that are allowed. This one says continuous retry. This one doesn't say. This one also doesn't say. Because this one has a variable retries. It can be adjusted. This means it will try how many times to light the pilot. It will go through how many 90 second trials for ignition before it will stop trying. Lockout. What happens when all trials for ignition are unsuccessful? What will happen? Some controls will just plain old boom, shut off and not do anything again until they have their 24 volts removed and then reapplied. And of course, that can happen by either uh, breaking a demand for heat at the thermostat and then reestablishing a demand for heat. It can also come by turning the main power of the furnace off and then back on. Other one will have the same effect. It will cause the lockout to be erased and the system will retry. Other uh, modules will do go into what's called a soft lockout, also known as a watch guard. Well, they will stop trying for about an hour. And then after an hour, they will go through their ignition sequence again and go through their number of retries again. The idea behind that is they may be thinking, well, maybe somebody just turned the gas off temporarily. And that's why it won't light. And maybe they will have turned it on after a while and that will successfully fire again or refill the propane tank or whatever. Uh, to, uh, the cause of the lack of fuel was. So the idea here is that when you're going to replace a control, all of these four variables um, must be duplicated in the uh, replacement control. Now in the case of universal controllers, this is a universal ignition control. This controller could replace this one. This universal controller has a pair of dip switches on it, and in fact, so does this one. These dip switches need to be adjusted in certain configurations. So number switch one is on and switch two is off, or they're both off or they're both on or, or vice versa. That is going to uh, cause the programming of this controller to duplicate another controller. So when I'm gonna replace a gas ignition control, and I wanna use this Honeywell uh, universal controller to replace it, I have to read the book that comes with it. There's a nice fat instruction booklet that comes with this thing. And what I will want to do is I'll want to look at the model number of the control I'm taking out. For example, this one is a S8660K control. When I open up the book for this new S8610U control, I'll look up where it says S8660K. And it'll say, okay, for an S8660K, move switch one to this position, move switch two to this position, and then install the control. Now this one will now have the same pre-purge feature and retry feature and trial for ignition feature that this control had. 
you have to do that. You have to make sure you set these correctly. This thing will operate for a certain number of tries, and I can't remember exactly how many it is, but it's a limited number. It's like three or five or ten or something like that. Once this thing has gone through that number of cycles, that setting that was set on the dip switch is burned into its memory. And you can now move the switches all day long and it will not change its operation. It is locked into that mode of operation. So if you install one of these and you don't set it correctly, and then you say, oh, nuts, I forgot to set that ignition control. Let me go back over to that job and readjust it. Chances are it's too late. It's already going to be burned in to operate the way it was when it came out of the box. And the default setting for this is a zero pre-purge and a 90-second trial for ignition. If your replacement control or your, the one you're replacing had a 30-second pre-purge and a 45-second trial for ignition, now this unit is operating incorrectly for that um, application. You always want to duplicate the function of the original control exactly. And that's the only way a universal controller can be applied. Let's take a look now at the um, non-integrated hot surface ignition control module. The function of this is going to be very similar to the one we just saw before with a couple of differences. First of all, the ignition source is not a spark now. It is a hot surface igniter. The hot surface igniter, of course, is a 120 volt device, right? It's operated off of 120 volts AC. In order for our ignition controller to operate that device, we have to have 120 volts AC. So on our non-integrated HSI control, you will find 120 volts between terminals L1 and L2 at all times. These terminals may be called 120V hot and 120V neutral N, something like that, depending on the controller. Now, the most common types of of um, non-integrated HSI controllers is this one, the White Rogers 50E47 and all of its variants, the White Rogers 50E series, and the Honeywell S8910U. This is the S8610U. The S8910U looks almost exactly the same, but it is generally green. The old ones were green. I'm not sure what color they are now. So we have 120 volts here, and this is something I want to make you very aware of. Anytime you have an electronic circuit board of any kind that controls a high voltage load, it will have high voltage connected to the board, just like we have here, 120 volts between these two terminals. Be aware that that high voltage does not power up the control. All electronic circuit boards almost universally are powered by 24 volts AC. Those that are not are incredibly rare examples, but there are some out there. So almost all electronic circuit boards are universally powered by 24 volts AC. So I bring this up because this is a common uh, common concern. I, uh, I'll, I'll take you way way back in years when I was um, I was the only service technician at this startup HVAC company, and I was run running ragged. I was on call 24/7. When this company first started up, you know they were struggling to get customers, and there wasn't really a whole heck of a lot going on in the service department. It wasn't too tough for a single person to handle. But then another competing company went out of business, and a lot of their customers came over to our company. And suddenly, like overnight, it was like a switch flipped, and the, the service calls were coming in like crazy. And I was getting worn out. I just couldn't handle everything, being on call 24-7 every single day. And uh, so we started looking for some help. And one of the um, people we brought in was actually coming from a – residential new construction sheet metal background. So his background was hanging duct and uh, cutting in boots and uh, stuff like that. 
which was very different from doing diagnostic service. So he was not very well equipped with service skills, um, but he was somebody that I could work with and help him out on the phone. So that's what we did. We did a lot of talking on the phone. And uh, one of the challenges that I had working with him was getting him to use his multimeter, right? So um, we um, we had a call one day. He was out there, and we got to the point where I made him, he had to call me before he replaced any parts just so that I could verify his diagnosis. Because it, it, first of all, I was spending so much time just going around fixing all of his mistakes. Like it wasn't very helpful. So I, we, we came up to this so system. you got to call me anytime you want to replace a part. So I says, okay. So he calls me up one day. He says, Eric, I think I've got a bad board. I said, okay. Tell me why you think your board is bad. I'm trying to train him and on his diagnostic thinking processes. He says, I've got a hundred, I've got voltage of a board. He says, I've got power at the board, but it's not doing anything. I said, okay, how much power do you have at the board? What is your voltage measurement? And he says, it's 120 volts. And I says, okay, go back out into your truck and go find your multimeter. I know you're not using it and go back and actually measure how much voltage you're actually getting at the board. So he says, okay, I know that you don't have 120.0 volts AC displayed on your multimeter. If you do, go buy a lottery ticket because that never happens. It's usually something like 118.6 or something. I want to know what is your voltage, where and when. So he goes and gets his meter, comes back, and he's like, it's 121.7. See, I told you I got power of the board, but nothing's happening. This is okay. 120 volts doesn't power the board. It just sits there and waits. Measure between the SEC1 and the SEC2 terminal, because that's the terminals on that board. What do you get? We're looking for that 24 volts AC. So be aware that all of your circuit boards are powered by 24 volts AC. It's a very common mistake to assume that it has 120 volts and it's not working, therefore it's bad. Not the case. It's not going to work when it has 120 volts, because 120 volts doesn't do anything. 120 volts just sits there and waits. And this is your first example of that. 120 volts is applied between terminal L1 and L2, and it just sits there and waits. Internally, inside the board, terminal L2 and terminal HS2 are physically connected together. There really is absolutely no reason to have separate terminals for them. It's just two convenient places to park that wire. These two wires could be flipped around and nothing would happen. They are the same thing. When 24 volts is applied to the TH terminal, through the thermostat and limits, and safeties, pressure switches, whatever those are in that particular furnace circuit, then the control wakes up. That's what powers it up. When it receives 24 volts at TH, the igniter will be energized. And to do that, it simply closes a set of contacts between the L1 terminal and the HSI terminal. This then takes that 120 volts that was coming in and relays it right back out to the hot surface igniter. At the same time, the igniter warm-up timer begins its countdown. Igniters don't reach their operating temperature right away. They take some time to warm up. You'll notice this if you ever watch one. It'll start, slowly start to glow and increase in intensity. The length of time that igniter is allowed to warm up is going to vary between furnace to furnace, manufacturer to manufacturer. That is one of the specifications that, say, train engineers into their furnace. They say, I want this igniter to warm up for 15 seconds, whatever it is, before the gas valve is energized. So that's what this control will do. It will energize the igniter and then do nothing else for the next period of time. That is the igniter, igniter warm-up timer. When that period of time elapses, it will close a set of electrical contacts between the TH terminal and the MV terminal, sending that exact same 24 volts that came in to power the control out through the MV terminal to power main valve. The main valve should then open, sending gas to the burners, striking the hot surface of the hot surface igniter and causing the flames to become established. When the flames are established, that presence of flame will be proven by means of flame rectification. And if that flame rectification is successful, if it's able to tell the flames have successfully been lit, then it will de-energize the hot surface igniter. That is the 
pretty much the complete sequence of operations of a hot surface ignition control. Control is energized by 24 volts through the thermostats and limit safeties. The igniter is energized and the igniter warm-up timer begins its countdown. When the warm-up timer elapses, the main valve is energized. Flame is proven by flame rectification. The igniter is de-energized. The control module continues to monitor flame signal throughout the run cycle. When the demand for heat is satisfied, the control and the main valve are de-energized. Now, if you're troubleshooting a control, this is what you really need to know. You need to know what it's supposed to do and when is it supposed to do it. Here's an example. I had a call one time where I was the, this is now the third time out on this call. The company I worked for installed this furnace for this customer. It was a high-end furnace, high-end expensive installation. And this was probably in year three of operation, right? So we are within the parts warranty period from the manufacturer, so on and so forth. Now, this particular manufacturer also requires that any warranty parts that are replaced must be returned. And they will check the part to verify that it is in fact failed before they will actually honor your warranty credit. You have to buy the replacement part first, and then if they get your part back and they will say, yes, we will authorize warranty credit on this part, then you get your money back. So uh, first technician goes out, they were complaining of no heat in the middle of the night, couldn't find anything wrong with it, working fine. Happens again, same technician goes back out, once again, can't find anything wrong with it, off we go. Happens a third time. Now the customer is irate. They are pretty upset. They, they continue to have problems, and in their perspective, we continue to fail to find the problem. So um, you wouldn't blame them, right? It's a, that's exactly what's going on. Something more is necessary, and it's hard to determine because every time a tech goes out there, the thing runs perfectly. So what are we going to do? I get chosen to go out and, and identify this and solve it once for all. And one of the things that you should know is when you're having intermittent problems like this, you are not going to find the source of the problem until you can observe the problem in process. There's nothing, there's, there's no way around it. So the only thing to do is sit there and watch the thing cycle and run over and over and over again until it happens. So how often does this problem happen? Well, it's been happening once every two weeks. Okay, so you can do some quick calculations in your head. How many times do I suppose this furnace may cycle uh, normally over that period of time based on the weather? I'm gonna have to sit and watch this thing fire. I figured about 50 times in that case because it was fairly mild weather. It was just in the, in the uh, early fall. Furnace didn't run much during the day, maybe a few times in the night. So I say to myself, okay, if I watch this thing fire at least 50 times, I should be able to see this problem because that's what the pattern seems to be. And sure enough, I saw the problem. What was happening was it would um, energize the control. It would go through the igniter warm-up time. Um, warm-up time would elapse. Main valve would be energized. But every once in a while, I could. it looked like that as soon as the main valve was energized, the igniter started to dim just a little bit. So now I had to get my meter out and prove this and watch it go through another 50 cycles, right? So I, um, I, um, I do this and now I've got my multimeter. I've got one multimeter on the igniter and another multimeter on the gas control valve. So I want to know when the gas control is energized, it is supposed to go through a trial for ignition and that igniter should remain energized through that entire um, entire trial for ignition, which was seven seconds on this thing, it will keep the main valve energized for seven seconds and the igniter at the same time, trying to establish flame. And if it doesn't see flame, it will close the main valve, stop, uh, turn off the igniter, and then restart the sequence. The point being is that that igniter should remain energized until either A, the flame is established and proven through, through, through flame rectification, or B, the ignition, the trial for ignition timer times out. 
And, and one circumstance is one circumstance out of 50 I found out that when the main valve was energized, the igniter was de-energized at the same time. And that is not the normal sequence of operations. As it just so happened, it would still fire because the igniter was still warm enough by the time the gas struck it. But what was happening was that every once in a while, the igniter would cool substantially before the gas would strike it and it would not fire. And that would happen and it would lock out freak chance of events that it, that would do it. Very hard to find, but that's how you find it. You compare what it's doing to what it's supposed to do. And if it does any one thing that it's not supposed to do, that is the red flag and that board is demonstrating a failure. But in order to know that, you have to know what it's supposed to do in the first place. Just like our uh, um, intermittent pilot control, Hot surface ignition controls have variations in their sequence of operations. And these have to do with, first of all, the timings. The igniter warm-up time and the trial for ignition time can vary from furnace maker to furnace maker to furnace maker. Number of trials for ignition will vary. Uh, lockout action, just as before, will vary. Now, on universal replacement controls, like this um, White Rogers that's on the screen here, they will have uh, breakaway taps. This is inside the box, you'll get these um, five or six little tabs, and you'll look up in the book and say, okay, you're replacing this control to make the new control behave the same way the old control did, install tab D. And it will duplicate the same igniter warm-up time, trial for ignition, number of trials, pre-purge, lockout action, and all of that stuff. So um, that's that's what those little tabs are for. If you if you over opened up your S eighty nine ten U or you opened up your fifty E forty seven, that's what those do. They uh, configure the control to behave in the right way. So you're like, oh nuts! I lost my tabs. What do I do? If you look through the instruction manual of this uh, control board, it will tell you what all of these timings are for each individual tab or each individual setting. Some of our new ones now have little dip switches that do basically the same thing. You'll notice that setting A or tab A gives you the most strict, safest form of operation, which is the longest igniter warm-up time, the shortest trial for ignition, the fewest number of trials for ignition, and the most severe lockout action, which is going to be a complete and hard and total lockout. This is going to result in the safest operation. So um, if you, are for some reason, forget to put the tabs in or didn't know that they were important or lost the tabs, uh, no tab installed is the same as tab A in most cases. Now read your instruction manual to be sure, but that is often the case. In general, the worst that will happen is the thing will just fail to fire because it doesn't have a long enough trial for ignition to really fire the fuel. So just a, a little helpful tip there if you're ever in that situation. Now, I'll be honest with you, non-integrated hot surface ignition modules are rare. They were rare when they were first introduced, and today they're even rarer. There's not a lot of them out there, uh, but now when you run into one, you'll know exactly what they do. Okay, let's have a look at the Honeywell S8610U's wiring diagram and kind of put some of this information together. The main transformer that powers the whole system, of course, is located off the board, but this is the main transformer in the furnace. And I want you to notice that that THW terminal, if we back up behind it, it goes through the thermostat and through any normally closed safety limit controls. And there's a note here, note two, uh, which is showing us an alternate limit controller location. And most of the time in our um, modern furnaces, we're going to see the limits after the thermostat. Um, this diagram is actually based on a much older diagram. Remember, this is all about you know what came before. Way back in the olden days when we first started uh, retrofitting intermittent pilot controls onto standing pilot furnaces, you would have frequently found the limit control actually over here in the hot leg leading to the transformer. So that when the furnace would overheat and um, uh, it would actually kill the transformer and everything downstream of the transformer, including the gas valve. Uh, so this is showing an alternate to that, which was a more modern improvement by putting the limit in the low voltage supply of the transformer. 
but today you're normally going to find that limit uh, after the thermostat somewhere. Also, any other, just be aware that this just represents any low voltage safety, such as limit controls, uh, pressure switches, rollout switches, and so forth. So when the 24 volt applies here, that is what powers up the control. A second branch of power comes off of that to land on the 24 volt terminal, and there's a note there, note seven. It says, if the vent damper is connected, wire the 24 volt terminal as shown. Connect the vent damper cable in place of the plug shipped with the S8610U. And this is an older diagram before that black one came out. If no vent damper is connected, do not wire 24V terminal. You will find yourself making this mistake, and I know this because I've made it dozens of times, and so have lots of folks that I know. When you install one of these, instead of landing on the THW terminal, you're going to land on the 24 terminal, because that just makes sense. I'm putting 24 volts in, I'm going to put it on the 24 volt terminal. And when you do, you're going to turn the thermostat up, push in the door switch, develop a call for heat, and absolutely nothing is going to happen because the 24 volt terminal doesn't do anything to power the control. It's on the one next to it. So now that you know that, you're going to experience that and go, oh, I should have moved the wire over the TH terminal. It'll save you a lot of grief. Of course, that vent damper plug, wiring harness plugs into a vent damper. Spark electrode comes over here to the spark igniter. Flame sensor, now note six, Remove the jumper and connect the sense terminal on two rod application only. This old system here, this old S86F, only doesn't have a separate terminal for the flame sensor. It only has one for the ignition cable. In this case, the ignition cable is the flame sensing cable. That one wire is doing double duty. It's both flame sensing and providing spark. So if you're replacing a control that only has one electrode, on the pilot burner, then you are going to keep that little tail plugged in to the sense terminal. And now your spark wire is going to behave as the flame sensing wire. In this case, I've got a separate igniter and a separate sensor. So the sensor gets its own wire and its own terminal, and the spark electrode gets its own wire and its own terminal. Come over here to the ground now. 24 volt ground, you can see, comes back to the transformer and look at note four. Note four says, controls in the 24 volt circuit must not be ground leg to transformer. It's indicating that this is the grounded leg of the transformer. Now on this diagram, that ground actually occurs right here because this terminal is connected to this terminal inside and that ultimately is grounded. Notice it is also connected to the pilot burner bracket. This is part of the flame sensing circuit. And we're going to talk about flame sensing next. The flame sensing signal is going to be generated here at the sense terminal. It's going to travel down the sensor wire, go to the sensor itself, ultimately passing through the flame and returning back to the control through this ground conductor. So if this system is not properly grounded, it will not work very well and it will experience odd, weird, intermittent failures. So before you condemn an ignition control module or any other circuit board, you do want to verify that you have a good ground because they need that in order to live. Okay, let's move on. Flame rectification, flame sensing. What in the heck is that? It's an electronic circuit. And so if you know how this circuit works, you're going to be a huge leg up in diagnosing problems with it. What is it? Well, a flame sensor, which is really a special metal steel rod, is positioned so that it is enveloped in the flame. So when the flame is established, it literally swallows up the flame sensor. High AC voltage is applied to the sensor. And I say high AC voltage, I'm talking in the neighborhood of 50 to 90 volts AC in somewhere in that neighborhood. It can vary, but uh, from control to control. So, uh, but it's going to be higher than 24 volts um, in all cases. Current is going to flow from the sensor through the flame. Yes, the flame is going to behave like a part of an electrical circuit, which is absolutely cool. 
through the flame to the burner head and then return to the controller by way of ground. The original AC voltage is rectified into a pulsating DC current. And this is the amazing thing, is that this flame fire, it's called flame ionization is the, is the technical term, but uh, the flame actually behaves like a voltage rectifier, transforming that AC voltage into DC voltage. And as it does so, it consumes a very small amount of electrical current. The control board is programmed to measure the strength of this pulsating DC current. Now be aware that before the flame was established, there was only AC voltage. Once the flame is in contact with the flame sensor or the flame rod, that AC voltage is rectified into DC and a small amount of DC pulsating DC current is generated. And that current then is measured by the control board. Based on the strength of that current, Based on what that value of that current is, the control will make a logic decision whether to proceed with the heating sequence or whether to shut down and retry. Pretty cool. Here's a picture of a typical pilot burner with an ignition electrode here, and the ignition electrode will spark to the pilot hood, igniting the flame. The flame will then swallow up the flame rod or the flame sensor, and that's this guy here. This particular pilot burner also has a grounding strap. This is really just a stainless steel um, bracket or fork that just bends over the top of the pilot burner. It's forked in the middle so this sensor doesn't actually touch it. It actually sits in between the forks of the ground strap. The flame now is connected to the end of the burner. It's touching the burner. It swallows the flame sensor and a portion of the grounding strap. The signal from the flame rod then passes through that flame to ground or just to the head of the pilot burner. And on the bracket will be attached a wire. Ultimately, there will be a wire there that is going to ultimately go back to ground on the control. And even on integrated furnace controls like this, these are all grounded and that ground transmits that flame signal back to the control board. So let's see how this works. First step on testing this out is to make sure that that high voltage signal from the control board is going to the flame sensor. That high voltage signal or that high voltage source will be present at the end of the flame sensor wire whenever the control is powered with 24 volts AC. In the event of intermittent pilot controls, that is going to be an intermittent. Anytime there's a demand for heat and 24 volts is here, that's when you will see that high voltage signal coming out of the flame sensor terminal. In this case, the sensor wire was removed from the sensor. The multimeter is adjusted to measure volts AC, and we are measuring between the end of the flame sensor wire and a ground location. And this is the burner manifold screw is a great place to catch a ground. And he is measuring 43.7 volts AC in this location. So that's our high AC voltage. Yeah, it's not 110 volts. It's actually coming from the 24 volt source through some electronic circuitry being transformed into this 43 volt signal. Next, we're going to measure the strength of the flame current. So in order to do that, we need to place our multimeter in series with the flame sensor, and we need to change it to start measuring microamps DC. Now, not all electronic or digital multimeters will measure microamps DC. Your specific uh, HVAC meters will, and especially the more expensive ones. Most, a lot of folks like to use field piece meters. They're very popular. But be aware, not all field piece meters will measure microamps DC. The less expensive ones do not. The more expensive ones do. So I know for sure that the HS35 and the HS36 do measure DC microamps, whereas the HS33 does not measure DC microamps. So make, when you're buying a meter, make sure that you have the ability to measure DC microamps. So this meter is set up to the DC microamps setting, and there's the symbol for DC, the straight line with the three dots underneath it. Underneath that is the little micro symbol, which looks like a miniature lowercase u with the tail in the front of it, and the capital A, DC microamps. One meter probe is connected to the sensor wire, 
the sensor wire is removed from the sensor itself. The other meter lead, the black one in this case, is attached to the sensor where the wire came from. So the, the signal that's being generated from the control board is going to pass through the meter and onto the sensor through the flame and back to the control. So whatever the control sees, the meter is going to see displayed on the screen. This is the closer up shot of that um, connection. So the burner is allowed to cycle, the burner's light, and the amount of flame current is displayed on the meter. In this case, it's 1.72 microamps. Now that's not milliamps, it's microamps. Milliamps is one one thousandth of an amp. Microamp is one one millionth of an amp. Very, very small amount of current. Make sure you get the terminology right. You've got to have at least a stronger than 1.0 for that control to run. Most all controls are at a 1 to 5 signal strength is it considered appropriate. Less than 1, it will say, no, I'm not going to run. More than 5, it will say, no, I'm not going to run. So the flame rectification circuit cannot be jumped out. It cannot be fooled. It cannot be temporarily bypassed. You have to have a flame there. It has to be in the right place at the right, point, the right time in order for this circuit to work. It's called proving the presence of flame. Some notes about sensors. Sensors will get dirty, they'll get contaminated, and this will cause the flame current to be diminished. Because remember, all of these components are part of an electrical circuit. Also, the pilot burner, um, the attachments of the pilot burner, uh, the tips of the burners, all of these things need to be clean and fresh just as if it were an electrical circuit to make good electrical contact. Corrosion, rust, and any other contamination on those surfaces will diminish the flame signal. Contaminated fuel or contaminated combustion air, chemicals in the combustion air, will get burned in the process and deposit themselves on the flame sensor. And it will create a nearly invisible ceramic-like coating on the sensor. Now this coating acts like an insulator and it causes a loss of the uh, uh, amount of flame signal being transmitted through the flame. And this is going to cause the control board to think that there is not an adequate flame present and it will shut down. It will ultimately lock out. If this situation occurs, which it will uh, from time to time, that sensor needs to be cleaned. There's a right way and a wrong way to clean a flame sensor. In fact, there's two right ways and a whole bunch of wrong ways to do it. Ideally, you do not want to use any kind of abrasive on your flame sensor. So no sand cloth, no emery board, no files, uh, no scotch bright pads even. Some of those are pretty aggressive. No, uh, uh, um, no flat discs <laughs> if you have one of those. Uh, because you don't want to scratch the sensor. The sensor is made of a very hard uh, steel alloy. Very hard, very brittle. And when we use an abrasive on it to clean that coating off, it cleans it very well, but it leaves deep scratches behind in the surface of the metal. The next time the burner fires, those scratches, those little valleys created by those scratches, will quickly become filled in with combustion products. So now, very quickly, the remaining surface area left on the sensor with which to sense flame is going to be greatly diminished and will be right back into a low flame signal situation very quickly. So don't clean sensors with scratchy stuff. You want to use either steel wool or a handheld steel wire brush, such as a shoehorn brush or a fitting brush. Don't use a brass brush. It'll leave brass uh, behind, um, which will cause problems. Don't use sand cloth. Don't use sandpaper or anything abrasive or scratchy. Ground is important. Here is a Johnson Controls intermittent pilot ignition system. And the grounds, also known as all of the 24 volt common connections, see this jumper here is actually physically connected to a metal plate on the back of the control board. So this control board has two mounting tabs on it. And notice they are metal grommets. They need to be physically screwed down so that the ground is transmitted to the ground of the furnace itself. I've seen a lot of times where this particular board will be installed and it'll just set on the furnace. 
it might work today, but a few days down the road or weeks it won't work anymore because that ground isn't very strong. So pay attention to those grounds. Very important. And here is our sense terminal on that one. But the sequence of operations of this control is exactly the same as the one I showed you before. Notice the terminals are labeled just a little bit differently and in a little bit of a different location. Also, no vent damper possibility with this one. When you're going to measure flame current with an intermittent pilot control, you have to measure the flame current when only the pilot burner is lit. So you want to capture that flame signal between when the pilot burner lits and when the main burner lights. You're looking for, and you should be measuring flame current on almost every single call. Anytime you're doing any work on a gas heating system, measuring flame current is a really good idea. You'll start finding things where the flame current is a little bit low, but not quite low enough to cause it to drop out. And then you can clean that sensor and measure a noticeable improvement in the, in the flame signal quality. You just stopped no heat before it started. When you have an intermittent pilot, however, you want to prevent the main valve from being energized. So we will either disconnect it from the control module or disconnect it from the, from the gas valve. This way, the system will go through its sequence of operations. It will prove pilot flame through the meter, but it will be unable to actually fire the main burner. Now, we won't know that because the control board proves pilot flame. We want to make sure we have a safe pilot flame before we discharge the main gas to be uh, lit by that pilot flame. So here, I once again, I have the uh, multimeter set to measure DC microamps in series with the flame sensor. So here it's disconnected right from the board, and the signal from the board will come down the meter lead, through the meter, back to the sensor wire, and on down to the sensor. When the thing fires, the pilot flame will light, and whatever flame signal is being generated just by that pilot flame will be displayed on the meter. Once the main burner kicks in, that uh, flame signal will jump. It will be a lot higher. So if you're not noticing that it's really close to low when only the pilot flame is lit, you could be failing to notice a potential problem. Also be aware that the quality of the pilot flame has a lot to do, and the main burner, if it's a main burner sensor, has a lot to do with the quality of the flame signal. So sometimes low flame signals are not because of a, a dirty flame sensor or not because of a bad control board. It could be because of a dirty ground or improper uh, sorry, dirty burner, or improper gas pressure. If your flame is not fully engulfing the pilot burner because of low gas pressure, that's going to cause flame sensing problems. If your gas pressure is too high and the pilot flame is actually lifting off the burner a little bit, it's going to cause a broken connection and lead to flame sensing problems. So knowing how this whole flame rectification circuit functions can bring you a long ways toward not misdiagnosing bad control boards and you're really getting to the bottom of the problem. And that's another common issue. Control boards get replaced all the time because of what looks like an inability of the control board to see the flame when really it's just responding to other external conditions. So you have to be aware of that. Next, we're going to talk about blower control boards, which are also known as fan timer boards. The main job of a blower control board is just that, to control the blowers. As I told you before, the old electromechanical control would uh, turn the furnace fan on when it warmed up and turn it off when it cooled down. Well, that worked and it served the purpose, but when we start getting air conditioning involved and potentially fan on involved, now we have some more complicated fan operation, right? Multi-speed blowers, one speed for heating speed, one speed for cooling speed, maybe a third speed for fan on. That's a little more complicated to control electromechanically, even though we struggled along and did it for a number of years. One of the big advantages of having a uh, blower that turns off and on based on time is it leads to more energy efficiency. So instead of waiting for the actual temperature to reach a certain point in the furnace, after a demand for heat starts and after that burner turns on, let's turn that fan on after a preset determined amount of time. Because we know there's BTUs available there, let's start delivering them up into the condition space as soon as possible. And that increases the energy efficiency of the whole appliance. What it does is it minimizes waste up the flue.
Okay, so that's one of the big reasons why uh, this came into place. Now, the, here is an early fan timer board. This is off of a carrier unit. I want to call your attention to a couple of things. First of all, take a look at this screen. Uh, we've got a fuse on here. So that is going to be protecting the transformer, not the board. That's a 24 volt fuse, and it is protecting against any shorts from damaging the transformer. It doesn't protect the circuit board. Be aware of that. So if you're getting blown fuses, that's not necessarily a board problem. Chances are the problem is somewhere in the low voltage wiring off the board. These black boxes here are relays. This is the relays that turn on the blower. And this furnace is, this board is from a draft induced furnace. So it has a relay for the draft inducer. It has a relay for the blower, two relays for the blower. One relay is the blower on relay. The other relay is the speed selector relay. Is it going to run cooling speed or heating speed? All relays have the ability to malfunction uh, in their contacts. They have physical contacts that come together to transmit the voltage to the fan, to the load. So uh, anything that can happen bad to a relay can happen bad to a blower control board or any control board that has relays on it. So contacts can stick shut, contacts can fail to come together, contacts can be burned and pitted. All of that can happen on one of these boards. And so when that does, you cannot replace the individual components. You have to replace the entire control board. Another thing that I want to mention about all control boards is that we do not replace components on the board. Some folks are pretty savvy with electronics and they'll say something, for example, hey, I can see that that, I can test this out and I can see that that resistor has failed and I can replace this resistor and get that board back online again. I caution you against doing that. I know there's some folks out there that advocate that. Don't do it. Because if the board has experienced a significant amount of heat stress to a damaged one component, other components are likely to be damaged as well and performing out of spec. That whole board is ready to completely crap out. Don't mess with just rep repairing it because something else on it is going to fail. That whole board needs to be replaced. Second of all, on more modern pieces of equipment like this one, uh, look at some of these tiny, teeny, teeny, weeny, itsy bitsy components on the back of this. You don't have a prayer of replacing that. Those are all machine produced. They're too small for humans to really get in there and work on them. Don't even try. Replace the entire control board component as a whole. One thing you should notice here on this board, look at this. Is This is a resistor. And when resistors function, they get warm. And this resistor is positioned in a hole to allow airflow to circulate around it. Anytime you see one of those that is standing off the board significantly or it's got a cutout around it, that resistor is meant to get hot. If that resistor is damaged from heat, it got hotter than it was supposed to. Something is wrong that's causing that to fail. Don't just replace that part. Um, it's not going to fix the problem. Okay, so that is, uh, in a nutshell, what I want to tell you a little bit about circuit boards and repair. You replace the whole board. Don't change out individual components. So I got a fan timer board here. This is uh, Honeywell ST, ST9120C4040. This has been replaced by ST9120U Universal, which will replace all of the ST series blower control boards. Lots of other companies have made blower control boards too. So once again, it's helpful to know the main idea. All blower control boards have three main jobs. Job one, control the blowers. Send that one already. That's going to be our circulation blower and the induced draft blower. Job two, monitor the safeties. Safeties are going to be pressure switches and limit switches. Provide control action based on those switches. Now, the blower control board does not have a whole lot to do with the pressure switch, but it can pay attention to it and flash a light or give some diagnostic feedback if the pressure switch isn't doing what it's supposed to do at the right time. Limit switches, on the other hand, require a corrective action, right? 
So if a limit switch is opening, the uh, control board needs to respond by making sure that the fans are running. So anytime you open a limit, the control board needs to turn on the fans. And that's a really great way to test a blower control board, at least test one of the features. If you're looking at a furnace that has a blower control board like this one, one of the things you'll want to do to test it is open the limit switch. I like to just pull a wire off the limit switch and the control board should respond by turning on the fan immediately. Because if the limit switch is opening, that means things are too hot and we want to cool them down. So the blower should, res the control board should respond by turning on that fan to hopefully cool things down. That's the idea. That's the main idea, right? Third, it serves as a central junction point for all the components in the unit. So you're going to find almost everything lands on this board, but it doesn't necessarily control everything. So that's an important thing to remember, too. I've seen lots of folks say that, that my God, my, 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 I've got a blower control board and my burner keeps turning off and on, so I'm going to replace the control board. Well, the blower control board doesn't have anything to do with your burner, so even, though it's, even though it physically lands on it, or it seems to be. Let's take a look at the schematic for one of these blower control boards. This is our Honeywell board, and um, all of our other blower control boards are going to behave like this, too. Notice that all of the components in the furnace pretty much land on this control board. We've got high voltage components up here. Our high voltage power supply, 120 volts, lands on the board. Doesn't power the board, lands on the board. Our transformer also lands on the board. So 120 volts lands on the board and it provides the power source for all of these 120 volt loads, our fan motor, our draft inducer most specifically, also an electronic air cleaner like the old Honeywell F50 air cleaners. If there's a 120 volt humidifier, it can be powered from here as well. And the primary side of the transformer, all of those are connected. 24 volts comes out of the transformer. It, it lands on the bottom of the board down here at X and C. This is what powers the control board. Now notice this has also a separate ignition control module. That's what controls ignition. The blower control board has nothing to do with the ignition sequence. It could even be a standing pilot as far as the blower control is concerned. It does not know what's going on with ignition. So any problems you're having with your burner are probably not related to the control board. A couple of things that aren't so obvious here, however. This is something that you should know. Anytime you see a board that has a fuse on it, like this board has a little 3 amp fuse on it right there. This diagram shows a fuse as well. This older Honeywell board does not have one, the new ones do. Anytime you see a fuse on a control board, what you should do not see is that 24 volts from the transformer on the X terminal first goes through that fuse, then it comes from the Molex plug, goes off the board through the limit in the rollout switch and comes back to the board and then ends up at terminal R. So it is possible to experience 24 volts on X and not have 24 volts on R. If either the fuse is blown or if any of these off-board temperature activated safeties are open. In that case, if one of these are open or if the fuse is open, you should experience the fan running because it thinks it's hot, it's trying to cool it down, and the status indicator light should be flashing a code which is represented by an interpretation that says, open limit or open rollout or open fuse. On a demand for heat from the thermostat, 24 volts from W, tells the control board I have a demand for heat, power up the draft inducer. Draft inducer powers up, starts running. That same 24 volts now leaves the board off of that terminal and comes over and waits at the pressure switch. The job of the pressure switch is to verify that the draft inducer is running and flowing correctly. And when it is, the draft inducer will suck, suck the pressure switch closed, sending that same 24 volt signal from W onto the ignition control module. And now the ignition control module will do its thing. So the blower control board now needs to know when do I turn on the blower? And we want to turn the blower on a certain period of time after the burners have lit. 
So in this case, once the ignition control module energizes main valve, a wire taps off of that and comes back to the control board. And this is what informs the control board that the main burners are lit. Begin the blower on delay timer. And after that time's out, it will send 120 volts from the L1 terminal over to the heat terminal and send that 120 volts out to whatever speed of the blower is connected to that terminal. Lots of, get, lots of boards get replaced because the thing that they're supposed to control doesn't run. So be aware that control boards don't even know or have anything to do with whatever the final device is doing, such as a fan motor, right? The control board's job is not to turn on the fan motor. The control board's job is to cause an electrical set of contacts to go like this. And that's it. That's all it does. That electrical set of contacts, in this case, is positioned in between the L1 terminal and the heat terminal. And if they go like that, the board did its job. That doesn't necessarily mean the fan's going to run. The fan has to have its own stuff straightened out in order for that to accomplish an operating fan motor. So knowing that specifically, when I'm looking to see if this board is working, I'm looking to see, is it sending 120 volts out the heat terminal, yes or no? If it's not doing that, then yes, I may have a problem with my board. But did my board get that 24-volt signal to tell it to run in the first place? If it didn't, there's nothing wrong with the board necessarily. Why is it not getting that 24 volts there? Is that wire broken? Is it not attached properly? Did the ignition control module not send the 24 volts out to MB to do that? All those things are involved. So when you're troubleshooting circuit boards, one of the first things you have to ask yourself is, A, is it doing what it's supposed to do? Is it sending the 120 volts where it needs to go? B, is it getting what it needs in order to do what it's supposed to do? So that's where diagrams like this come really handy so you can be able to figure that out. I want to talk briefly about dip switches. Dip switches are tiny little switches that are mounted on a control board that will change something with the sequence of operation. And this particular control board that we're looking at here is a, uh, I believe that's a train furnace. And this is a variable speed two-stage gas furnace. And these banks of switches right here, there's another bank of switches right here, when they are arranged in a certain sequence, it will cause a certain effect in the furnace, either control the CFM that the blower delivers, it'll control timings, on and off timings, and other things like uh, that nature. Whenever we're having trouble on a control board that has a series of dip switches, it pays to read the manual, to find out how those dip switches are supposed to be set, and make sure they're set correctly, especially on new installations. If you're experiencing operations that are not satisfactory, one of the first things you check is the dip switches. And I believe this is a uh, another version of that same board that we're looking at here. Here is that multi-pin connection for the variable speed motor, and there are my bank of dip switches right there. Sometimes there will be jumper pins instead of dip switches, and they do the same thing. Uh, there may be a series of two or four pins with a little jumper that can be rearranged in different places to control the, what the control board does. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about integrated furnace controls. Integrated furnace controls do a little bit of everything. They control everything in the system. And just like the blower control boards, there's relays, but now look, there's more of them. Um, more wires, more stuff. There's just more of the same thing involved. Lower control boards essentially have five jobs. The, I'm sorry, integrated furnace controls have five jobs. Uh, the first one, control the blowers, just like the blower control did. Monitor all of the safeties and provide shutdown response. That includes your pressure switch, that includes your limits and your rollouts. Control the ignition sequence completely. So they're also ignition control systems. 
They also provide a central junction point for all the components in the system, so everything lands on the board. And five, they provide operating fault condition feedback, which are going to be found in the forms of uh, LED flashes or perhaps even a LCD digital readout. The more complicated the board gets, the more things that it does, the more diagnostic feedback it needs to give us so that we can find out what's going on. Now, a word of caution on diagnostic feedback. This is primarily going to be in the form of a flashing light that will flash in a code. Then there will be a table on the blower door that will identify what that code means. So five flashes followed by a pause, followed by five flashes and another pause. That means something. That usually doesn't mean that there's something wrong with that thing. Right? It could mean that. For example, if it's showing that I have an open limit switch. It doesn't necessarily mean replace the limit switch. A lot of folks will do that. They'll replace the limit switch. It'll still say a bad limit switch. Then they'll replace the board. It'll still say bad limit switch. This is telling you that something is going on with your furnace that it's responding to. And that's what you need to fix. So if the pressure switch isn't closing, there could be something stuck in the flue. Your condensate drain could be closed, or your draft inducer could be failed, or, 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 or. Replacing a control board should be the last thing you think of. Pause the recording here and take a minute to look at this drawing. This is the schematic drawing for a gas furnace that uses an ignition control module that's very similar to this one. This is a carrier board and this is a, uh, a carrier family of products. And this is probably the very best electrical schematic diagram that really shows what an integrated furnace control does. And I'm going to take you, walk you through this diagram. I want you to pause the recording and take a close look at it, um, get familiar with it, and then I'll walk you through it uh, when I come back. Okay. So what we've got here is we've actually got two different representations of the same thing. There's two different drawings, both showing the same thing in different ways. On the right, this thick black line divides the two sides. On the right is the ladder diagram. On the left is the connection diagram or the wiring diagram. The two go together and the one that we're going to look for uh, first is the one on the right, the ladder diagram, because this shows the logical sequence of operations. Now, one of the big challenges of working on electronic circuit boards is that you can't see what's inside them. And this drawing is really great because it does that. But there are certain things that you still can't see. You can't see the programming of the microprocessor. You can't see that. So you have to know what the sequence of operations of the appliance is. So this is your greatest secret weapon that I'm going to tell you right here. If you're looking at a completely unfamiliar piece of equipment, in order to know what the control board does, read the section of the installation operation and maintenance manual that's titled Sequence of Operations. And it will tell you exactly what the timing is. Now, it might not be in so many words. You may have to read between the lines. But it will say something like, when the thermostat calls for heat, the draft inducer is energized. Then when the pressure switch closes, the ignition sequence begins. Things like that. So it's telling you in what order things happen. Now, I'm going to walk you through this schematic diagram. and this sequence of operations that we're going to describe and the way in which it happens is pretty much the same for almost every gas-fired um, induced draft furnace that's been built within the last 25 or maybe even 30 years. So that is what we're going to go through and I'm going to show you how the control board does that. And this sequence of operations, like I said, you can take this to almost any other furnace. Now, variations, minor discrepancies, small details will exist in different furnaces, but by and large, this is how they work. Using the schematic diagram and the way that I'm going to show you that we go through this is the way to find those differences and identify 
um, the actual sequence of events for your furnace, okay? Now, one thing, one big heads up. Take a look on the right side. Look at these two dashed line rectangles here with all these numbers in them. These represent plugs, right? And this one has two plugs. Here's one that's got 11 pins in it, and there's another one up here that's got a couple in it. There's another one right here. So this one is showing us three different plugs. Here's a control board that has three different plugs. There's one right there, one right there, and one right there. Those plugs are shown on the wiring diagram where they are. There's our 11 pin plug right here. Here's our 11 pins. There is a bunch of them there. I think nine pin plug there and a two pin plug there. You'll find them on the board. They're numbered. So here when I say I'm going to go out pin four of PL1 into pin three of pin PL7, where's PL7? There it is. Where's pin three? There it is. What comes out of there? Oh, we've got an orange wire. That's the way how we use these two diagrams to figure out specifically where these terminals that we're looking at over here, where they exist actually in the unit. Here's a better view of that same um, schematic diagram. Whenever we're going to look at a ladder diagram, we've got to find two things first. First is the power supply. The power supply should be either at the very top or at the very bottom. In this case, it's the very top. There it is right there, 115 volts AC, L1 to L2. Next thing we look for is where is the transformer. The transformer should always be somewhere in the middle, and there it is right there, kind of in the middle. So now I know that everything between the power supply and the transformer is all high voltage, all 115 volts AC. Every switch, every wire, every load is 115 volts. All my 115 volt loads are up here. So what are they? What have we got here? I've got a fan motor, a hot surface igniter, an induced draft motor, and the primary side of the transformer. And that's it. The low voltage side is everything below the transformer. Everything down here is low voltage. Notice that this big gray section is the printed circuit board and it is in the low voltage side of the circuit. So let's follow, let's trace this diagram out. 120 volts goes through the door interlock switch, lands on the L1 terminal. Inside the board, and this is the nice thing about this diagram, is it shows what's inside the board. It will travel down and it will stop and wait at the normally open contacts of the blower relay. So here's the blower relay contacts. Over here is the blower speed selector contacts. It will travel on down to the normally open contacts of the induced draft relay and sit and wait. And it will travel on down to land on terminal PL1, which stands for primary, line one, primary side of the transformer. And that is where the transformer is connected and powered by. Notice that the 120 volts doesn't actually power anything other than the transformer, which isn't even mounted on the board. It's just connected to two terminals on the board. So the terminal L1 uh, right here and the terminal PL1 are physically connected inside the board. They are physically connected together. Pretty cool. So whenever the transformer receives power, it should be sending out 24 volts AC. And those 24 volts AC are going to land on the SEC1 terminal and the SEC2 terminal. SEC is short for secondary, meaning secondary side of the transformer. So we are going to assume now that everything is ultimately going to come back to SEC1, and it does. So we're going to have like all of our um, 24 volt return is going to end up back here. So we're not going to follow all that. All of our controls are going to be in the hot side of the transformer, which is SEC1. So 24 volts lands on SECC, SEC1, and in the board, it comes down and it powers the CPU. That is what powers the control board. That 24-volt power supply, that's what powers the board. 
Then it also passes through the fuse that's on the board. It's my little three amp control fuse. Got one right here. When it leaves the fuse, it branches off and forms the CPU of that fact. Then it goes through the board, leaves the board through the series of plugs on pin seven, goes through the normally closed flame rollout switch, through the normally closed limit switch, comes back on pin four of the board, passes through the board to reappear at terminal R, terminal R on the low voltage terminal strip. Now I'm holding up this board. This board is not this board. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar. So I'm gonna show it to you. Back on terminal R for the low voltage terminal strip. At the same time, a branch comes off and informs the CPU of whether or not the limits are closed. So when the control board is flashing a diagnostic code saying the limit is open, it doesn't actually know what the temperature of the limit is. It doesn't actually know if the limit is open. All it knows is that it does not see 24 volts at pin four of the plug. That's all it knows, okay? So whenever you're seeing a limit code flash or any other code flash, you wanna verify that it's true knowing exactly what that means. So if I see a fault code being flashed that says open flame rollout switch, I need to realize that the board doesn't have any idea what the flame rollout switch is doing. All it knows is that it does not see 24 volts right here. So I want to know, does the board, is the board actually behaving correctly? Is there an absence of 24 volts right there? So my next step is to get my meter out. I'm going to go back here and to see it, do I have 24 volts? at um, terminal um, four, which is right there on PL7. Terminal four of PL7, terminal four of PL7 is right there. It's the one in the middle row, and um, I'll measure between terminal four and SEC uh, two or common, if I have a C terminal on the board, I'll measure it there. That'll tell me, do I have 24 volts there or not? Is the board responding correctly? So if it is, I'm not going to worry about the board. I'm going to go back and see where am I losing my 24 volts. Is it even sending it out here? I could have a malfunction somewhere here in the board. I could have a broken fuse. It's not going to know the difference between those things. So don't necessarily condemn the limit or condemn the board until you know for sure that it's telling you straight. Next, 24 volts comes to R. Now, for there to be a demand for heat, my thermostat wire is connected here. That R wire is gonna go up to my thermostat. Thermostat's gonna call for heat and send to that same 24 volts back to the W wire. At that time, it branches off and tells the CPU, hey, I've got a demand for heat. So what does the sequence of operations say is the first thing that happens when there's a demand for heat from the thermostat? It's going to energize the draft inducer. What it's actually going to do is it's going to take this set of contacts up here, the IDR contacts, and cause them to close. That's its response to seeing 24 volts on W. It's going to close these contacts. Those contacts now are going to close and send that 120 volts that's waiting right there on down the line. A portion of it's going to go and sit and wait to the hot surface igniter relay and another portion of it's gonna go down through a plug off the board, through another plug, and into the induced draft motor, and the induced draft motor should start. Just because the induced draft motor doesn't run, doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the board. You could have a problem with the connections in these plugs. You could have a problem with the motor itself, and so on. Once the draft inducer starts running, it's going to suck the pressure switch closed. Let's follow this W circuit. It goes off the board from pin two through a low gas pressure switch when used, and that's typically on propane installations, on down through the normally open pressure switch. And now this is measuring gas pressure. This is measuring induced draft pressure. When the induced draft pressure runs up to speed, it is going to suck this switch closed, send that 24 volts back to the board, 
And inside the board, it's going to branch off in two places. One, it's going to appear here at the HUM, or humidifier terminal, and that's where I would connect a 24-volt humidifier. This is going to make sure that the humidifier only runs when the heat is on. And it's going to branch off, come over here, and sit and wait at the normally open contacts of the gas valve relay. And it's also going to come over here, branch down, and ensure and inform the CPU. This is how the CPU knows that the pressure switch is closed. So when it sees 24 volts on W, it is going to respond by closing the draft inducer, and it's going to start looking to see 24 volts right here again. That's going to let it know that the draft inducer did, in fact, run and close the pressure switch. If it doesn't see 24 volts right here, it is going to start flashing a fault code that says, hey, um, I've been giving it uh, some time and the pressures. I never saw the 24 volts. I didn't get that message. I didn't get the letter. It's going to throw a pressure switch fault. So now if you're seeing a pressure switch fault, you want to know, does it see 24 volts right here at this plug or not? Once it does see 24 volts right here, now it knows that the pressure switch is closed and this is its signal to energize the igniter. This is part of the printed sequence of operations. First the draft inducer starts, and the pressure switch closes, then the igniter glows. And the way it glows the igniter is it takes and closes these electrical contacts up here on the 120 volt side. Sending the 120 volts that came from the induced draft relay in through the hot surface igniter relay on down to the HSI. Notice there's a bunch of plugs and wires and stuff in series here, any of which could prevent the HSI from running, including a broken HSI. It's going to start the hot surface igniter warm-up countdown timer at this time, and once that timer has elapsed, it's going to respond by closing the normally open contacts of the gas valve relay, sending that 24 volts that started at R, went through W, all the way through the pressure switches, and now it's going to close those contacts and send that same 24 volts out to the gas valve. The gas valve is going to be energized, it will open, flames will be established, which should be then sensed by the flame sensor through the process of flame rectification that we already talked about. Once the board sees that flame rectification signal, it will de-energize the hot surface igniter and begin the blower on warm-up timer. That actually happens right here. When it sees that the 24 volts has gone to the gas valve, boom, this comes back and forms a CPU that the gas valve is energized, and then the blower on delay timer will time begin. 30 or 45 seconds later, however long that timer is, the control board will close these normally open contacts. When that happens, 24 volts will appear at the electronic air, I'm sorry, 120 volts, will appear at the electronic air cleaner terminal, and it will continue on to the blower speed selector relay, which since this is in heat mode, it will go through the normally closed contacts of the speed selector relay and on to the power up whatever speed is connected to that, which in the, this is, is demonstrated as medium low, and the blower should begin, it should run. That is the complete sequence of operations, and if you follow it through, it will show you where all of your test points are. So in troubleshooting a control board, what you want to look for is where does the sequence of operations stop? What does the control board think is happening, and is that actually happening? So realize that when the, um, when the um, um, control board is saying um, pressure switch is open, all it knows is that it's not seeing 24 volts right here. So now you need to identify where that is in your furnace by using the pictorial diagram, finding that pin on the here and actually measuring to see whether or not you have 24 volts right there to know if that board is telling you appropriately or not. Now one thing I want to point out, almost all control boards now, this one has, these are both blower relays, there's two of them. So there's my main blower relay and my speed selector relay. Here I've got another one that's got two relays on it. Relay contacts have amp ratings. All of them do. And on these relays, those amp ratings are printed right on there. One of my relays is a single pole normally open, and that is 
that one right there labeled BLWR. Another relay is a single pole double throw. That's my speed selector right here. So the amp ratings of these contacts are printed on the surfaces of the relays. And here's what this one says. Uh, this one says that my normally open contact of my BLWR relay is rated for 30 amps. On my other relay, I have a normally open contact and a normally closed contact. And this is the weird one. The normally open contact is rated for 20 amps. The normally closed contact is only rated for 10. Now this kind of makes sense because the normally open contact is going to run cooling speed, which is usually a higher speed and needs more amps. The normally closed contact is going to run the lower speed, which is normally our heating speed. I want you to notice when you start looking at blower control boards that we've got our, our integrated furnace controls that all of your high voltage equipment is on one side, all of your low voltage equipment is on the other side. This is to try to provide some physical separation between high voltage and low voltage. If high voltage gets into the low voltage, it's going to wreck everything. That's one of the vulnerable points of all control boards that have high voltage landing on them is the control board is meant to run on low voltage. In fact, it runs on low DC voltage. The 24 volt signal is immediately converted into a low DC voltage and that's what runs all of the electronics. When high voltage interferes with that low voltage, that's when damage happens to the control board. So take a look. What if something were to happen to this fan motor? If that fan motor bearings were to fail and that fan motor were to seize, or if the windings of that motor were to short, all of the current being drawn by that motor is going to be pulled through that normally closed 10 amp contact. In those cases, there is very, very likely that the amount of current being drawn is going to exceed 10 amps. That is going to cause problems for that relay contact. And notice right here, I've got a 3 amp fuse right next to that on this particular one. I got low voltage very close to my high voltage. When they put all these boards together, they try to package things. Problems on my high voltage can bleed over and start affecting the electronics of my low voltage side. When you find that you have a problem with your control board, look at the blower motor. Is that a replacement blower motor or is that the original blower motor that came with the furnace? There's a very good chance that that's a replacement blower motor. The, what may have happened is that when that blower motor failed, it caused unseen damage to the control board, but not enough to cause it to fail right away. Then over time, that damage accumulated and ended up being a failed control board also. Something you should think about when you're replacing blower motors. And it's, you know, the, the price of that blower motor, it's not very much. Uh, we can get that in there, get you going, no big deal, right? Be aware that this control board might be right around the corner. And depending on what kind of a motor that is, that dollar amount can be significantly more expensive, right, for a replacement control board, depending on what it is and who, who makes it and where it comes from. So think about that next time you're looking at a failed blower motor. What is the health of that control board? Those amp contacts are, by and large, this contact right here is generally only 10 amps. That thing seized up in heating mode. It could have been cooking that board with 12, 15 amps or 20 amps um, repeatedly, causing damage on that control board. So bear that in mind. So that's how we go through the full sequence of operations of the uh, control board. And uh, that is what these do. Now, when do we go to shut down? It's going to happen. Some other things are going to happen. The thermostat's going to open and it's going to kill 24 volts right here. That is immediately going to de-energize the gas valve. Realize that the power that opens the gas valve came through the thermostat, through the pressure switch, through the relay coil right here. So as soon as I lose 24 volts at W, I also immediately lose 24 volts at the gas control valve. They could have very easily chosen to relay the 24 volt signal to the gas valve, but they didn't. Why not? What would happen if those relay contacts were to stick closed? Remember when I told you that anything bad that can happen to a relay can happen to a control board? If those relay contacts were to stick closed, that gas valve would be stuck open and running wild. 
So having all of these safeties, including the thermostat operating control, in series with the gas valve is the way most systems operate. Now that has recently changed. That has recently changed. This board right here, this Goodman board, actually does not do that. This one will actually relay that 24 volts over. But it also has additional features where it will watch to see if there is flame present when there is not a call for heat and it will take a corrective action by running the draft inducer in the blower motor to pull that flame in when it's supposed to. And that's how they, one way that they get around that. But if you take, take some advice from this drawing. If you're ever going to be wiring anything in the field, uh, always make sure that all of your safeties and your operating control are in series with the gas valve to give that thing multiple chances to de-energize, shut down, and stop running. We don't want it to accidentally run well. Anyway, back to what I was saying. When the thermostat opens, 24 volts will be killed right here, and the CPU is immediately going to become aware of that, right? It's immediately becoming, going to become aware of that. So now it is going to go through its shutdown process. This is going to engage the post purge if there is one. So it's going to tell the uh, begin a timer that will shut the draft inducer off after, say, a 30 second post purge to clear out the heat exchanger. At the termination of that post purge, it will open the induced draft relay contacts. It's also going to begin the blower off delay timer. And blower off delay timers are often adjustable by way of uh, dip switches or jumper pins on the board. So once that blower off delay timer times out, it will open the blower contacts. Another feature that we didn't discuss is a, a safety feature where every time it gets a demand for heat, before it starts everything off, it's going to check all the safeties. It's going to make sure, okay, do I not have 24 volts here? Because I'm not supposed to have 24 volts there yet. Do I, yes, have 24 volts here? It's going to check our limits. It's going to check the pressure switch circuits. You'll find some boards where different uh, safety controls are in different circuits. So it knows the difference between the primary limit, say, and the rollout switch. In this circuit, the primary limit and the rollout switch are both in series. But take a look at the individual circuits on your control board diagrams, and you'll find out right away. You'll say, oh, look, all my rollouts are in one series loop from the plug back to the plug, and my limit is in a different loop from the plug back to the plug. My pressure switch is in a different loop from the plug back to the plug. That's how it knows the difference between an open rollout and an open limit and an open pressure switch. That's how it knows how to give you the right diagnostic feedback. Okay. Next, we're going to move on to universal replacement controls. And what we've got on the screen here is a White Rogers Universal 50A55-843. And I've got one right here. These are old timers, actually. These are left over from the late 90s, early 2000s era. But um, one thing I want you to notice, too, is I'm gonna, I don't know if you can see this, but right next to the Molex plug, there's a label. And this label shows what each one of the pins are, what each one of the pinouts on the plug are. Example it shows, it says, that one right there is TH. That's where my thermostat comes in. Next to it is FP. My flame proving signal comes out of there. HLO, high limit out. Down here is HLI, high limit in. So my 24 volts goes to my high limit, comes out here, goes through my limit, and comes back into the board there. Anyway, just wanted to call that to your attention. You might find little helpful hints like that on different boards you find in the field. Universal boards. There's no such thing as a universal board. Hey, Eric, what do you mean? It says universal right on the thing. Yeah, this was one of the first universal replacement control boards. And when this first came out, a lot of techs thought, awesome, man, now I don't need to, con now I don't need to get my control boards from the OEM anymore. I can just use this thing. What they didn't realize, and if you pull the instruction book for this board out and read the fine print, it says, this White Rogers 50A55-843 board will replace any White Rogers board that begins with the numbers 50A universally. So it's a universal replacement only for other 50A50 50 series. It's a 50A5 something something. This will replace any 50A5 something something board. 
but it won't replace a Fenwall. It won't replace a White Rogers it, or uh, other White Rogers. I can't necessarily use this one necessarily say to uh, replace this one. Can't do that. Now, if you're really crafty with a wiring diagram and a box of wire nuts and a wire stripper, you could probably make this work. Avoid that temptation. Don't do it. Because now you have seriously altered the design intent of that furnace. And anything bad that ever happens to it from now on is your responsibility personally. So don't, don't do that. Don't take that responsibility on yourself. Always use manufacturer recommended replacement components rather than universal if possible. Now Honeywell has a new universal integrated furnace control board. It's excellent. It's not cheap, but it is excellent. And what you get is you get the board and a whole bunch of wiring harnesses and a big fat book. And you have to sit down and read that big fat book and you have to look up and say, okay, this is the furnace that I'm working on. This is the board that I have. I want to put in this new Honeywell board. These are the specific instructions to do it, right? Use wiring harness A plus wire nut C with this extra wire here. Remove these components, add these. And it's going to take you a good several hours the first time you do one to get that changed over because it's a pretty big process. You may be pulling whole looms of wire out and stuff and, and replacing the whole wiring harness and redoing everything. But you're going to have to do that. So read all of the instructions. Adjust your dip switches right. Make sure that if you're using a universal, quote unquote, universal control, that the instruction manual says that you can use it for that application. And if it doesn't specifically say that, don't try to use it. Go back to the OEM supplier and get the OEM board for that thing. Um, don't use the aftermarket replacement because it's not authorized. If you do and something goes wrong, your aftermarket replacement board is going to say, I didn't tell you to do that. Who gave you that idea? That's your problem, right? So, so don't do that. Make sure that you are following manufacturer's instructions. Always use the OEM control board whenever possible. That's not always possible, and that's what universal replacements are good for. They're good for the middle of the night. They're good for the middle of nowhere. Um, but anytime you're able to get the replacement, uh, manufacturer's replacement board, do that. It's always a better choice. It's always a better choice. Realize that if you make the decision which control to use, rather than following the manufacturer's guideline and getting their authorized replacement part, you may be accepting legal responsibility for the proper function or the future safe operation of that piece of equipment. And that's just not something that you and I as service technicians and contractors should really be set up to do. Even though you might have the ability to get that thing working, you know what, you'd be better off running down to the local Walmart and putting in some temporary electric heaters in the house to keep them warm for the night rather than putting in that unauthorized control. I'm just It's just a possibility of disaster that you just don't need. The longer you work in this business, the more exposed to risk you potentially are. So make sure if you're always doing everything the way the manufacturer tells you to do, you won't have anything to worry about. Well, we don't have enough to worry about the way it is, right? Of course, control boards are now found in lots of rooftop units. And now instead of just controlling the heating sequence of operations, they also control the cooling sequence of operations. So they're going to be doing things like monitoring pressure switches on our refrigeration circuits, uh, controlling condenser fan motors as well. And so the uh, functionality that can be engineered into one of these control boards is really great. So really to get to know how to troubleshoot a board like this, you need to spend some quality time with the wiring diagrams and the sequence of operations from the manual. And I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, there is no easy way to go about it. You've got to spend that time. You've got to do that reading. You've got to know what that board is supposed to do in order to know whether or not it's doing its job correctly or not. And this is really, really clear on rooftop controllers. Rooftop control equipment can be very expensive. I've got one over here. Uh, let's see where to go. I did have it. Let me find it here for a minute. 
Here it is. This is a control board out of a, a train rooftop unit. This control board uh, wholesale cost is over $400. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it's over 400 bucks. Um, you def definitely want to be sure that your diagnosis is correct before you decide to just go and buy one and put it in. Um, otherwise, you might be responsible for paying for it if you bought it for no good reason. Compressor anti-short cycle timers. These are little control boards. They're really not intelligent. They're really just a timer. It's really just a digital timer is all it is. And what these are for is it prevents the uh, contactor from being energized um, until it's been off for at least five minutes. Let me say that again. The anti-short cycle timer is going to be in series with the cooling thermostat as well as the high pressure switch and the low pressure switches in the refrigeration system and any other refrigerant related safeties that might be involved. So that if one of those safety devices is opening and shutting off the compressor, it won't allow the system to run for five more minutes. So say for example, the low pressure switch opens and then closes right away. Well, under, if it weren't for this guy, that would mean that the compressor would turn off and then back on immediately. And that is going to lead to a failed compressor. Uh, as big and brutish as some of those big uh, 06E and 06D compressors look, they're actually pretty fragile. And slamming off and on is not something that they are happy to do. So the anti-short cycle timer will keep the compressor off for a minimum of five minutes. Now there's some other features that it has as well, which aren't always used, such as the X terminal right here, the X terminal. The X terminal is going to send 24 volts out the X terminal anytime there is a fault or anytime the uh, anti-short cycle timer has been engaged and it's going to illuminate a diagnostic light somewhere. Those usually aren't actually connected. And when you're looking at one of these things, it can be really confusing. So know that that's what they do. These anti-short cycle timers are, in a word, they're junk. <laughs> they fail frequently. And what they'll do is they will fail to bring the com allow the compressor to run when it's supposed to. Every time the thermostat calls for heat, their normally closed contacts will open. And what will happen is they'll just stay open. So the next time the thermostat calls, I said heat, I mean cooling. Next time the thermostat calls for cooling, this anti-short cycle timer will be holding it up. This is one thing that you can bypass temporarily just to get the thing running again. You should keep in your truck a ICM delay on brake timer and it will directly replace one of these compressor anti-short cycle timers with only two wires and do the exact same job much more reliably. And that's what I recommend. 86 this little bugger here and put in the ICM DOB delay on brake timer and you'll be fine. Next, before we go, I want to talk about communicating controls. Communicating controls are becoming a lot more common in residential applications, specifically with the uh, Emerson ComfortNet control system, which is showing up in both uh, uh, Goodman products, it's showing up in ArcoAir products, it's showing up in um, Lots of different brands on the marketplace. Their communicating systems are all comfort net. Um, Carrier has their own infinity controls. Uh, Lennox has their own communicating controls. Uh, the Carrier Bryant, Infinity Evolution, those are all examples of communicating controls. And communicating controls have been around for a long time. Uh, specifically, uh, many split air conditioners, the control boards, communicate with one another back and forth. So if you remember back, let me flip back a couple of pages here to the schematic diagram. We said there that this control board is really primarily a thinking relay, right? It has timing involved. It has a specific sequence of operations that it follows every time, subroutines, and it basically just closes relay contacts. It doesn't have a whole lot of thought involved, some but not much. Our communicating controls, on the other hand, have a tremendous amount of thought involved. And they are actually sending packets of information and communication back and forth to one another. Let me show you an example. I've got some boards here that came out of a, an LG mini split system. And uh, here we go. 
So this is the main control board that came out of the outdoor unit, it came out of the condensing unit. This is that one here. And connected to it are our indoor units. Here's the main control board in one of the indoor high wall mounted units. And here is the other one. So I've got two zones, one condenser, and uh, two indoor units. There's a bunch of other little micro boards connected to these as well, but these are the three main ones, and these talk back and forth. And uh, this, I, I bring this up to illustrate some of the challenges in troubleshooting circuit boards. The more complicated they become, the more difficult they are to work on. So we have to rely on the diagnostic feedback that they give us. Now this image on the screen right now is out of a Liebert um, computer room unit. It's a small one. You can see by the compressor next to it, this is a ZR18. This is a one and a half ton condensed, uh, one and a half ton computer room unit. Now uh, we'll talk about the Liebert in a minute. First, I want to talk about this um, this um, um, LG. It was. The LG had some diagnostic feedback being displayed at the indoor units. It has a series of diagnostic LED indicators. And when I found this one, it was flashing an indicator that was shaped like a pineapple. <laughs> I've, got, I've got no other way to describe it. It was a flashing pineapple. And I did not have the uh, instruction booklet for the thing. And I had absolutely no idea what flashing pineapple meant. Um, I found out later that flashing pineapple meant that the high pressure switch was open and the high pressure switch was in the outdoor unit. So the outdoor unit was able to, is able to convey diagnostic information to the indoor unit. So it was able to say, hey, let everybody know that there's a high pressure switch open by flashing the pineapple. Um, I, it's not actually a pineapple. I don't remember what it's supposed to look like, but to me it looked like a pineapple. And uh, in order to figure this out, I had to call tech support. And in a lot of cases, that's what you're going to have to do because the schematic diagrams don't show the programming, don't show the software. And the only way to know what the software does is to talk to somebody who knows what it's supposed to do or read the book. Now, in this case, I did ultimately get the instruction manual for this unit, and it really wasn't all that helpful. It, it just wasn't written clearly. It was poorly translated from Korean. This was an older unit. They're much better now. And I just, I needed help. So I called up for help. And it was a good thing that I did because the guy on the other end of the phone walked me through step by step each probe. What I had to do was I had to pull this whole board out from where it was with everything still connected and start probing into all of these little pins down here when they were connected. And there is no way I could have known what to expect. Everything was DC volts. Everything in, on these boards is DC. And I don't have the ability to know what they're supposed to be. Only the engineers and the factory people know that. And so he walked me through step by step. He's like, okay, measure here. What do you get? You get this or that. Okay, measure here, measure here, measure here. And we ultimately determined that this thing had been struck by lightning and it had affected both the outdoor control board, it had affected the uh, liquid expansion valves, and it affected both of the indoor control boards. I never could have figured that out by myself without that extra information. So the moral of the story is when you're on some of these really high-tech electronic control boards, you're going to need help. And don't be ashamed to call up and ask for it. The more complicated these products are, the more technical support these factories are giving us. And they will help you out if you call them up. So make sure that you do. And they're very valuable. I've had the same experience on Mitsubishi units as well. Now, in this case here on the screen, we've got a... Um, a Liebert unit, like I said, and I want to point out some unique things about this Liebert unit. Here's a close-up of that control board. One of the first things to notice is that there is zero high voltage on this board. Everything is low voltage, everything is digital. Down here in the lower left-hand corner, you see three thermostat wires plugged in. Those go to the controller on the wall, which is a user interface module. It's no longer a thermostat. It's a user interface module. No longer does it have contacts opening and closing, sending 24 volts AC to Y and G. It doesn't have that anymore. Instead, it's actually communicating back and forth. And on a lot of these communicating controls, the module on the wall is not a thermostat. All it is is an information interface center. It senses room temperature and transmits that information to the control board. 
it receives the set point from the end user and commits that information to the control board. So now the control board can say, okay, I understand that I'm set for 68 and my actual room temperature is this. Therefore, I am going to make a decision to do this. I'm going to energize first stage cooling, for example. Then I'm going to tell and I'm going to send an enunciation to the interface module to display that first stage compressor is running. That is how it works. It communicates back and forth rather than switching things off and on. Another thing to notice on this board is that there's really not any relays. There's a couple of small relays, but more importantly, we have these devices that are called triacs. Triacs aren't switches. They behave like relays, they behave like switches, but they aren't switches. They don't have contacts. They're much more reliable. It's a solid state device. Instead of closing a set of contacts, what it does is it lowers the resistance between two points to allow current to flow. They're much more reliable than relay contacts are. So those two things combined really help this uh, control board um, minimize any potential damage it can have from high voltage spikes and anything else having to do with relay closures and high voltage. It's going to be very reliable. Look at the size of that microchip on there. There's a lot of processing power in this thing. This control board controls a electric heater, it controls a multi-stage compressor, it controls an evaporator fan, it controls a, uh, a condenser fan, and it controls a humidifier, if I didn't say that already. Uh, it controls a lot of stuff, and it interfaces and sends alarms. It monitors our safety switches, our pressure switches, our temperature switches, our condensate overflow switch, um, a discharge air temperature, it monitors all these things and sends enunciation back to the main uh, or to the user interface module. So how are you supposed to troubleshoot this thing? Where is my 24 volts on Y? Well, it's not there. You have to learn to trust your user interface module. You have to learn to trust that because that is your diagnostic feedback. Probing this board with a multimeter isn't going to give you a whole heck of a lot. What you need to know is the sequence of operations. You need to look at the um, look at the controller and see what it's telling you. If it's telling you that it's sending uh, it's energized first stage cooling, what does that actually mean? What that means is it should be energizing the contactor coil with 24 volts AC. That's what it means. So if it says first stage cooling on, and of course your reason why you're there is because there's no cooling, that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. You want to check and see, do I have 24 volts here at the contactor coil? That's what it means to start first stage cooling. If the answer is no, well then we trace that back over here and see why. Does it have any other alarms? Is it showing that the pressure switch is open? Is it showing that the condensate is open? Anything like that. Um, it's going to lead you where to look and then your next step is to follow up on that and verify that that's the situation and then correct that. Um, it can be a little bit more clumsy, but once you get used to that way of doing it, it's actually pretty nice. It's pretty reliable because this thing is actually pretty smart and all these communicating and control they are. Now there are circumstances where the boards can just plain freak out, but that's more rare on these than it is on some other things you might be used to. So let's talk about possible failures. What could possibly go wrong? Well, there's one thing. Let the smoke out. All electronic controls will do one of four things. It really simplifies troubleshooting somewhat. Either number one, they'll work normally. No problem. Number two, they'll fail completely. Which means they won't do anything that they're supposed to do. They're just completely dead. That's pretty easy to diagnose, right? Won't work at all with proper inputs applied. So verify you have the proper inputs applied. Make sure you've got 24 volts on your secondary connections, number one. Three, they'll do everything they're supposed to do except one thing. Now I've seen control boards, for example, where that uh, high voltage flame sensing signal won't be sent out. It will close the draft inducer relay. It will, it, it will set, fire up the igniter. It will open the gas hole. It will do everything, but there will be zero coming out the flame sensor terminal. That's a bad board. Does everything it should do except one thing. Or they'll do everything they're supposed to do except turn on the blower motor. High speed works, but low speed doesn't. Everything except one thing, right? 
Four, act funny, which is intermittent behavior, intermittent problems, or erratic behavior. And like I told you earlier, the only way to catch that is to catch it in the act. And once you've found at what point it happens, now you can use the schematic diagram to start knowing where to look for your voltages, to find out where it's losing. Whenever you're having a problem, you're going to be losing voltage somewhere. And you want to find out where am I losing it and when am I losing it and is that appropriate or not to identify whether it's the problem with the control board or if the control board is responding to something else that's happening. For example, pressure switches. Um, I showed you how that pressure switch feedback goes to the board to tell it when the pressure switch is closed. In some cases, you'll find a pressure switch that will just be just chattering like that a little bit. It only happens sometimes. It will open and close so quickly that the control board won't register an open pressure switch. But because that pressure switch is in series with the gas valve, that quick bottle of the pressure switch kills the gas valve, but doesn't show an open pressure switch because it opens and closes like immediately. Gas valve is killed, which then means there's no flame signal, which means the control board recognizes that there's no flame signal, and it's going to stop its ignition sequence and restart again. Very clever, very clever. It looks like a, the board is losing power when it's actually the pressure switch. You've got to have your meter set up to catch that and verify that. Uh, when we talk about using digital multimeter, sometimes I talk about an electrical troubleshooting. I talk about using two meters at once, and I alluded to that before. I'm losing voltage here. What happens to it over here in some other part of the circuit at the same time? You've got to be measuring that with two meters. So here's some troubleshooting techniques that I want to leave you with. I've been kind of giving you little nuggets all along through this class. Here are some final words. Number one, note the state of the system when you get there. Look and see if there's any fault codes present. That's going to give you start pointing you in the right direction. Two, reset the thing and observe the organic sequence of operations up until from the start until the point of failure. What I mean by that is keep the thermostat in the circuit. Don't just jump out from R to W or R to Y to G. Use the thermostat. It's part of the system. By jumping things out, you eliminate the thermostat cable and the thermostat and can potentially be covering up a problem. So you may find, ah, eh, it's working normally today. It must be the board. I'll replace the board. And then lo and behold, it was the thermostat the whole time. Remember, the thermostat's a circuit board, too. It can start acting funny and only do stuff sometimes. Three, use your meter. Use both of your meters if you have to. Verify the actual presence of the indicated fault code. Verify that your voltages are correct. If the board is failing to energize a load, test the load first to verify that it properly works before you go ahead and replace the board. Test your fan motor. Test your gas valve. After replacing the control board, do a complete check of the system and test everything. And this means temperature rise, gas pressure, flame signal, amp draw on the inducer, amp draw on the motor, amp draw on the igniter. Uh, verify your timings are correct. Of verify all of that stuff before you leave. When I see people say things like, we replaced the control board on Wednesday and on Friday it went down again, every single time, every single time that happens, they did not do a complete check of the system. And if they had, they would have noticed that something else was wrong or something completely unrelated to the board was wrong and that was the real problem. Always do that. Now, if you're uh, new to service and new to troubleshooting, I guarantee that you are going to misdiagnose control boards. That's fine. But when you do install a control board, test everything. Do all of this stuff. And then when you do that, you're going to realize where you made your mistake. Uh, guess what? You probably should have done that first. But as long as you do it and you catch your mistake, if you replace a control board that didn't need to be replaced, don't charge for it. Learn from your mistake. Don't do it again. Find the real problem and fix that. But don't charge people for stuff that they're not benefiting from. You made a mistake. It's okay. Own up to it. Don't make it again. Learn from it. That's why we're here, to learn and to grow. Um, but make sure you check everything. And that's going to help you avoid making those mistakes or leaving them behind for your customers to find after you leave. Common problems. Reasons for failures. Number one, physical damage, most common problem. 
Don't use your screw gun to land the thermostat wires. Uh, hammer, have no business being anywhere near your control board. Water or moisture damage. It's not the fault of the control board if it gets wet. It's supposed to stay dry. It's the fault of the condensate drain backing up on the air conditioner, right? Corrosion or corro corrosive atmosphere, including dust and dirt. When you're doing your PM call, look at the control board and look and see how much dust it has on it. Get yourself a soft paintbrush and gently brush the dust off the control board. Dust is carbon-based material. Carbon is a conductor. Dust on the control board can cause electronic signals to be conducted through various ports of the board through the dirt and now you're going to have electricity going places it's not supposed to go, and that can lead to either scrambled software or a fried board. So cleanliness makes a difference on control boards. A lot of folks think, eh, hey, it's electronic. It doesn't care about dirt. Yes, it does. It can make a big difference. So keep them clean. High voltage issues and over amperage. We talked about that already, right? Spikes on the line, um, uh, dirty power causing electrical uh, noise on the line will affect the electronics. High amps will affect the electronics. High temperatures will affect the electronics. Relay problems, like we said, common. CPU issues. The microprocessor just deciding that it's uh, going to forget a few things. It's retired. Or even more commonly, number nine, it's not the board. That's a very common issue. So uh, the biggest thing I can tell you is before you replace a control board, I want you to be able to say in one sentence exactly what is wrong with that board. From now on, from this day forward, when you replace a control board, rather than writing on your service invoice, replace bad control board, period, get into more detail. I want you to say something more like, found control board failing to energize heat speed of blower motor, period. Ah, now that's a very specific failure. Followed by replaced control board. Followed by system now operating normally with a 45 degree temperature rise at three and a half inches water column gas pressure with an amp draw of 4.5 amps on the blower motor. That is a very specific diagnosis, repair, and testing sequence. If I'm your service manager and three weeks after you leave, your customer calls up to complain that her furnace is broken again, and it's your fault because you charged how many hundreds of dollars for a control board, and that wasn't the problem, and now you need to come and fix it free and give me my $400 back. If I see replace control board, period, I'm going to probably be given some money back. If I have a very detailed description, I'm going to be able to say something more like, Mrs. Customer, it appears as though when Eric was at your house, uh, he did a very thorough job, and so it's very possible that whatever is happening now may be a new development unrelated to his work. Now, of course, if we discover that the problem you're having today is related to that work, then there will be a discount or there will be a no charge or whatever. Um, but be aware that it's very likely that this is a new problem, and uh, if that's the case, we will be collecting for it at the time because you've got that documentation. You've got proof of what was wrong and what was right when you left. And that is very, very important. If you don't write it down, it didn't happen. Very critical. So that is the end of our presentation today. Um, Lots more to learn about circuit boards. How are you going to learn it? Pay attention. Spend quality time with those sequence of operations, those schematic diagrams, and your multimeter. Pull up a chair and watch that thing work. Watch it do what it does. And you are going to gain, 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 rather than just replacing things willy-nilly, which is what a lot of folks out there are doing. because. You don't know what else to do. Well, now you know what to do. It's up to you to go out there and do it, grow from it, learn from it. Thank you very much for coming. This is Eric Scheidel, the HVAC Service Mentor, and this is the conclusion of Electronic Circuit Boards for HVAC. I had a great time. I hope you did, too. I'll see you right back here for our next lesson. Thank you very much.